I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So let me just let everybody else know because in case I miss somebody. Okay. All right. Um, somebody said, let me know when you're back. Okay. Uh, I'm back. You can call in. Uh, that was my message to Curtis. Okay. So uh, we're going to go live in just a minute. I am recording. Today is... Uh, Today is what? Today is September the 2nd, and Curtis Boyle is just joining us. Hey, you. Hey, Curtis. So if, I, if, anybody, if anybody ends up hearing this later, what you're listening to right now is a little bit of behind the scenes before we start the show for episode 24 of Coco Talk. And hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Looks like David Ladd is calling in. Micro, Myro was calling in. Where did Myro go? Myro, it will catch on. Where did he go? <laughs> I saw him and I lost him. The internet works in strange ways. Steve, you lose everybody. There's David Ladd coming in. How do we get on, boys? He's asking. Okay, uh, call me on Skype. Directly call oh. you on Oh, crap. Directly. We got Boise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time for me to run away now. <laughs> Drencore. Mm. David, David Ladd, at your cervix. All right. You so. better just watch it now, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now let's just start talking about floppies again. No, right, right now I'm dealing with hard drive booting issues on the Raspberry Pi 3. No. There's a whole other episode. Oh, yeah. I could talk for hours on the stuff I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, right? You have. <laughs> Shut up, Dark. Okay. <laughs> looks looks like Karen is here. Hello, Karen. Our Karen is attempting to get in. And Grant. I'm trying I'm trying to get my soundboard going here. This is what I hate about this soundboard. Is it it comes, it goes. There's Karen. Hello everybody. Hey Karen. Hey. Okay. There's Karen. All right. So Karen is here, Bruce and Jacob are here, Grant Leedy is here, um, Boise Pete's asking, how do I join the call? I just noticed that Boise came online in Skype, so hopefully he'll be calling soon. Um, so we shall see. Uh, in the meantime, how is everybody? Doing good. Yeah, pretty good. Alive. <laughs> yeah, I'm with David on that one. Yeah. Okay, there's Myro. Doing much better hey, for getting some sleep. Myro's here. Boise's calling in. Steve, uh, how's your how's your bandwidth? Do we need to go to uh, just profile pictures or? or? No, I'm not. I'm not. Honestly, right now, I don't know. Okay. okay. We'll worry about that when the time comes. Hey, Boise, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Hey, pretty good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I can hear you. Hey, Boise. Hey guys. And there's Karen. And there's Mark. All right, well, um, I haven't heard from Rick yet, and I didn't know if, I mean, we're definitely going to mention um, and, and observe the passing of Dale Lear, but I didn't know if we were, we were going to make this an official, you know, in memoriam and whole nine yards, and I, I'd rather wait for, um, for Rick Adams, you know, since he was closest to him, to see, you know, if, if that's something that Rick is in favor of or when he likes to do it. Maybe it's just, a, I, you know, I don't know if the timing is quite right, so... Um, you know, I did, we definitely need to mention his passing because it is it is a great loss, not only to our community, but to this planet, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, yeah. So we'll mention that. But I mean, if we don't I don't have anything prepared or produced or anything like that. But we can definitely just talk about. Our, you know, some of us have more memories than others. And, and, and uh, Boise, if you're going to be here for a while, since you did interview him, if you wanted to speak a little bit to that as well. Um, I definitely think it's worth mentioning. Now, um, I do have a segment recorded that I'm going to run, which I recorded with um, with um, Nick Marentes last night from the Oz K Fest in Australia. So around 8.30 last night, which was 11 a.m. for them this morning, <laughs> we recorded that. So I have a little segment to show that off. It's like a smaller scale Cocoa Fest all around the Apple II. And it is in Australia, so it's kind of cool. Uh, and, um, we do also have something too, that has been produced for the show. And, um, I, because I wasn't sure if Nick was going to be able to attend today, I was able to give Nick an early, um, an early preview of this thing. 
and we have his reactions on that video as well. So, and I think at least one pair of people in this call know what I'm talking about right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a little special clip to play later too, and we'll get Nick's reaction. But Nick also said he is going to try to join us again, which, you know, for him, it's going to be 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So, um, on that note, we're going to go live. Uh, I'm going to start off with the national anthem, which is something I started doing recently, which happens to be um, quite uh, ironically, you know, the clip from Color Baseball. But we're going to start with that. We're going to go into the intro and then um, and then and we'll take oh, it Canada. Oh. <laughs> you want, yeah. Hey, if you want to sing, that, Bruce, I'd rather ha- I'd rather have you. Sing. Yeah, just don't expect me to join in. <laughs> I can't. Sing. Are, you, are, you, are you on deck for that, Bruce? Now we don't. No, 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 no. I think we'd have to do a Poco version of it, I think. Yeah, well, you know, what there, there's do? there's I'm a gonna, couple of them. I just haven't found them yet. I'm gonna find that clip from Coco Fest because I have it. I have the clip. I'm gonna find it. So you're gonna end up singing it on the show, whether you do it <laughs> yourself. I want or not. It or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hold on just a second here. Let me get ready to cue national anthem, and we're going live. Just a second here, folks. <laughs> You got no idea with Steve. Might be just audio for the stream. This is Cloud Talk. The nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. With your host, Mr. Gameplay Goodness himself, Stevie Strout. All right, we're live and welcome everybody to Coco Talk episode 24. And just to um, just to address what you guys were saying, yeah, I don't have the audio sharing right now. I do notice that that for the most part, introduces a lot of feedback um, in the Skype call. So I will share audio um, when there's a particular clip to share. But other than that, we won't do the audio sharing. Uh, and welcome, everybody. This is episode 24 of Coco Talk Live. And we've got a great panel with us, as always. And we've got some special guests who aren't always here. So let's let's acknowledge our, um, our, ex, our ex esteemed visitors today, starting with first and foremost, the lovely, the talented, the prolific... The um, almighty Myro, everybody. Myro is here. Yay. Mike Rowan. Hello, everyone. And Myro, it has caught on. It has caught on. Yeah. And we're glad to have you. Uh, another special guest with us, too, Mr. Boise Pete. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, looks like you are somewhere in a mission control, possibly there. So uh, hopefully there's a, a, a safe landing of the space shuttle today. Absolutely. Everything is uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Doesn't the space shuttle yeah. run OS 9? <laughs> level two it's nitrous nitrous nine so it did have six eight oh nines on it from what i remember yeah <laughs> michael brant has just joined us in the live chat hi michael brant also with us on the show he's been here since day one mark overholzer thanks for being here mark Thank you. we have um a couple of other foreigners with us we have bruce moore and his son jacob from o canada we have from parts of the universe unknown, David Ladd is with us. We have Grant Leety, also from the Great White North, Bill Noble and L. Curtis Boyle, two thirds of the Nitrous Nine founding fathers. Uh, from the UK, we have Karen Anscombe. Thank you, Karen, for being here. And then we have Ron Delvaux as well. Uh-huh. Hello, Ron. Hello. All right. And so here we are. We are uh, week 24 of Coco Talk. Uh, This has been a a, a fun ride. It's exceeded my expectations. I thought we'd run out of things to talk about once Coco Fest was over because this was basically a show that was, hey, we're really excited for Coco Fest. It was kind of like the week before Christmas type thing. We were all talking about what we're excited about. I thought we would have ran out of gas by now. Um, But luckily, this community still gives us things to talk about on a weekly basis. And so I'm glad to be here and I'm glad that people are joining us and watching us and and now listening to us because we're also a podcast. Um, So, yeah, the the story I do want to run at some point in time is going to be the um, the Oz K Fest clip. Well, um, hopefully Nick will be able to join us, Um, but maybe we can also start. And um, France is here, too. Okay, 
Thierry Vachez. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounced your, rain, your name properly, but okay, France is here. Okay. Hey, you got your Coco 3 yet? Viva la France. We're very happy to have you here. So why don't we just start off then by saying this, which is that, um, well, today is September 2nd, and yesterday we learned about the passing of Dale Lear, who uh, left us uh, uh, September 1st. Sockmaster just joined us in the live chat. Hello! Sockmaster is asking what is the topic today. The only major topic today, Sockmaster, is going to be talking about Oz K Fest, but I'm sure David Ladd can come up with an hour and a half of uh, floppy uh, forensic discussions that we could probably get into. Um, keep us all on the edge of our seats. Only an hour and a half? And, you know, yeah, well, you know, you got to save some for next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's part two in a 999 part series on the forensics of floppies by David Ladd. <laughs> but yeah, so. Um, Dale Lair has left us, and some of us know him better than others and, and longer than others. Uh, I spoke to him one time when it's Curtis and Bill Noble and I and a few other people. We interviewed him about a year and a half ago, and that was the first time and the, pretty much the only time I spoke to him. And uh, the things that I took away from that is, uh, you know, you, you can sometimes you can just kind of get a sense and a feel for somebody. But we know he's talented. He's made, you know, half a dozen uh, commercial games. We know he's a musician. So he's talented, but he was very humble. He was full of humi- humility. Um, and he was also very gracious and generous and sharing his time and his stories with us. And it just came across to me like, I mean, this is a really special, unique individual. You know, uh, that was my takeaway a year and a half ago, you know, and he had mentioned then on his interview that he was a cancer survivor. Uh, and it was actually in that recovery time when he when he actually did double back for the iOS. So um, and at that time he was, you know. He was he was he had bounced back and, and things were great. He was looking forward to joining us at Coco Fest this year and then I guess had a remission and was dealing with that and couldn't join us at Coco Fest. And now we learn of his loss. So uh, all I want to say is I'm grateful for having had a chance to at least speak to him one time. I obviously appreciate what he did for the color computer computer and my heart's thoughts and prayers go out to his family and loved ones. And I'll leave it out there and let you guys go around the room. I just have to echo your sentiments exactly. He's just a really nice guy. Um, a couple of people here have actually had chances to interview him. Boys, he did. Nick did for his book, Coconuts Back. Uh, it's got to be 17, 18 years ago now. Um, and he's just always a – he has been a very humble, very generous guy and, and just a generally nice guy to be around. And he made some of the best games ever, like Double Back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, like I said on the Facebook group, I still play it today. Yeah. yeah. Rest in peace, Dale. You will be missed, and you will not be forgotten. Yeah, I should. We should mention Rick Adams actually wrote a nice tribute to him. It's on Facebook too. So if you haven't had a chance to read that yet, definitely worth the read. Yeah, that was definitely a good uh, tribute. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think we. I mean, if, when we have time to prepare and compile, and maybe a proper, um, you know, tribute can be done. <laughs> Um, but I didn't want to really do anything official without giving everyone time to mourn, especially Rick Adams, who was closest to him. And, um, you know, I'm also thinking that, you know, there's timing is everything and it's sometimes a little bit distasteful to try to quote unquote cash in on something. So it is all out of respect and, and honoring his memory, but I believe we should do it the right time, the right way, you know? And so that look forward to one of those in the future. Um, Yeah. Uh, Boise, um, when you interviewed Dale, how how long were you speaking with him? Was it a, a series of sessions? Was it over the phone? Was it in person? Uh, no, it was it was. In, I'm sorry, it was uh, over the phone. It was one session. Um, I was looking back in my notes to see if I had anything immediately accessible, and I don't. But somewhere I have archived all of the audio that I did with all the interviewees in the book. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure I could pull it up, but uh, yeah, he was a very, as I recall, he was a very soft-spoken gentleman, real nice. Uh, it didn't, I think, go over an hour. Uh, and at the time, I believe he was living where he uh, was before he deceased. It was deceased in uh, Austin, Texas, which was interesting because uh, the, the other guy that I interviewed in Austin, who I actually went to see, was John Prickett, who also lived in Austin. So that was a, there were at least two Coco guys that lived in that city. But I yeah. for the book. 
so yeah, hopefully we'll have more more chance to celebrate his his life and his memory and and a future in a future episode. And I don't know if Rick will be able to join us today or not, but um, you know, my uh, my heart's and prayers go out to Rick too because I know he's close to him. I feel like I grew. I feel like I got to know Dale better through Rick because Rick, you know, Rick can't have a sentence without mentioning Dale Lear in it. You know, it's almost like a, it's like on his space bar. You know, it's in between words. Well, they definitely inspired each other. I mean, they worked together for yeah. years in California too. So yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Um, uh, going around the room, uh, anybody got anything they want to share with us as far as cool retro things you've done this week or anything you've come into across the Internet or anything like that? Nothing for me this week. I'm no. still doing work. <laughs> yeah. If uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear hey. you, Ron. Um, <clears throat> I found out that one of my multi-packs wasn't upgraded through uh, Jerry Nelson. Oh, you ran the peak on it? Yeah. And uh, I was trying to figure out why Deskmate wouldn't load with the SDC in slot three and the floppy controller in four. Um, <clears throat> it kept not booting. I have it on my, uh, I guess yeah, I posted I that. it. Yeah. And so um, it was real interesting. Barry is a very knowledgeable guy. Very Extremely. patient, kind courteous, all that stuff. He helped me through yeah. figuring it out. So I just want to say good things about him. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And Hugo DeFort has just joined us. Bonjour. Hello. And how are you? Uh, so nice to have you with us, Hugo. Uh, thanks. Oh, well, I tried to join early, earlier, but Skype decided to update itself, and it seemed to have crashed my whole computer. You know, it's a Microsoft product, so that was expected. <laughs> so OS9 isn't the only company we bash here on this show. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have nothing uh, against OS9, by the way. Uh, I use it mostly <laughs> to run King's Quest, but that, it seems to work, so that's okay for yeah. me. <laughs> Solstice is with us in his chat in the live chat. Hello, Solstice. Glenn Taylor says double back was the greatest. Uh, rest in peace, Dale. Thank you, Glenn, for that. Um, what's going on with you, Hugo? I noticed you've posted a few pictures in Facebook recently of some uh, seemingly tile graphics. You said it's not necessarily a new game or maybe it's a side project, but you you had some pretty cool things you've posted. Actually, a handful of them. Some of your kind of um, psychedelic color things that you've been doing and then this this more recent um like looks like game tiles and sprites you posted yes well uh, you know my my brain doesn't work in summer so i don't program <laughs> <laughs> but near the end of summer i started working a on a little game project uh before i'll be able to get back to my main project but really it's a game that i've been wanting to to make for a very long time uh, I guess some people here have played uh, a very old Coco game, which was named uh, Wild Catting. Yes. It's yes. a game where you try to try to find oil uh, on a map and install your pumps mm -hmm. and try to make money. It was a very simple game, but uh, I spent lots of time uh, playing it with my whole family when I was a kid on my right. first Coco, which was a Coco 2. And then a few years later, uh, in the mid-90s, I said, hey, I could program that in Turbo Pascal, but it was a total failure. Uh, everything I tried to do uh, led to uh, a very uh, intense loss of time and efforts. I wasn't ready <laughs> at the time. Uh, that sounds like Nick with OS9. So, <laughs> well, if I was a guy who programmed OS9, uh, it would have never, never had, well, if it would never work, period. You know, I, I've <laughs> tried to do a few uh, OS things on the Coco and didn't succeed. I'm not a seasoned uh, as assembly programmer. Uh, so anyway, um, I decided to get back to, to that game project recently uh it it's not as difficult to program as a video platform or game uh there's no live action no uh, scrolling etc but still uh it's quite interesting I, I want to make the game a bit more complex um 
uh, want to generate uh, maps using a fractal uh, algorithm, which already works, uh, by the way. And uh, I want it to be cute. So the cuteness factor will... I will try to optimize it. So maybe I will have something that works for 10D assembly. We will see. It depends on uh, how much time I, I'm able to squeeze on that little project. So, Are you going to be able to attend 10D assembly? I'm not sure yet. Really, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, due to, the, to my uh, work uh, schedule. Um, it's a bit complex. I have to, to take a few weeks off. Uh, due to the way my contracts are um, renewed. But um, I, at first, I thought I would be able to do that in October, but I have had to push it to December. So now I don't have any time off in October. So the only way I could attend would be to uh, fly in, fly out, you know. So okay. That would be for an expensive weekend, but we'll see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I'll leave uh, the the microphone to uh, to the other people attending. Bye. All right, thanks for joining us. And uh, Nick Morentis has just joined us from Australia. Good eye. Hi, Nick. Good eye, everyone. Hey, Nick. Good eye. I'm uh, reporting from the uh, Apple Oz K Fest at the moment. I'm in the uh, assembly hall and. Uh, it's 4 a.m. in the morning, everyone else is asleep, and I've um, been given the key to open up early so I can attend uh, this uh, Coco talk. That's very nice that they trusted you. This, this, is, this <laughs> is your chance to replace all the Apple IIs with Cocos, too, when they're all sleeping. So, well, <laughs> I've already backed the car up to the front door, and I'm about to do, uh, move the uh, Mark Twain uh, Apple II GS uh, uh, into the boot of the car, and I'm um, taking off. <laughs> <laughs> Do, does everyone know what a Mark Twain Apple II GS is? A Mark Twain, I'm not sure. I I've uh, I've heard of it, but I'm not exact on the details of it. But. Well, that's that's Mark, one. That's one that was autographed by Samuel Clemens, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> does it have a mustache? <laughs> no. Um, Hang on, I'll just turn the video on. Actually, um, you, uh, you've got a schedule, or maybe have a schedule, of uh, what you want to talk about. But uh, go ahead, and I'll get a few things ready here, and I can just show what the Mark Twain is. Okay. No, that's fine. And, I, and, and also, I have um, – I need to download this real quick. Since we have, uh, since we have uh, Miro here, I don't remember if I saved this. So you, sa you shared something with me, Mike, in Google Drive. And I'm trying to see if I had, um, I don't remember. And so anyway, so I'm pontificating. I'm just going to download it and save it again right now under bumpers. But everybody has, has everybody done their due diligence and listened to the latest episode of the Coco Crew podcast, first and foremost? Yes. I have. Oh, yeah. okay. oh yes. All right. So you're allowed to stay on the show then. <laughs> <laughs> that is a requirement. Uh, you cannot call yourself a coconut without doing so. All right. So what I want to do right now, since we have Myro here, uh, this every month, the Coco Crew podcast, um, you know, it just keeps getting better. And uh, not only is the show itself getting better, but the the Myro content just there's just more Myro per square inch uh, each new episode. And um, they're always great. They're always entertaining. You know, I can't say enough good things about them. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a look at one of the commercials that ran this month that um, Mike also did as a video for us, as, a, um, as an added treat. So this will be the time I will share audio so you guys can hear it too. Yeah, get, get your um, tissues so. ready. Get your <laughs> tissues ready. So we're going to share system sound, and here we go. Every day. A color computer is abandoned or abused. They live in the dark recesses of garages, basements, storage sheds, barns, and attics, waiting for someone to help. Hi, I'm Helen Bleeding Heart. Please say you'll be the answer for Coco suffering the effects of extreme temperature, overexposure to ultraviolet light, and conditions unfit for electronics. 
These Cocos need your help. Please call 888-6883 or go online and join the Color Computer Preservation Society with a monthly gift right now. For just $18 a month, you can rescue Cocos from their abusive environments, provide repair of damaged parts, administer retro-bright treatments, and most of all, provide love. Call or sign up online in the next 30 minutes, and we'll send you a photo of a Coco being lovingly reconditioned by the CCPS. And you'll receive this beautiful tote bag that declares, I saved a Coco. Yours for your generous, perpetual monthly gift. This is your chance to say, I won't sit by while a Coco is wasting away. Please, won't you call or go online right now? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was a good commercial. I like the village one too. Yeah, that that video needs to come with a box of Kleenex, I tell you. <laughs> the Myro hits, they just keep coming. I don't know how this guy does it. He has more talent than should be afforded any single human being. You really need to share some of that wealth. Um, but we certainly appreciate uh, every month. It is looking looking forward to the Coco Crew podcast is the highlight of my month. Um, again, not only for the show, but for the Myro. And I got a fever and the only prescription is more Myro. And so if you haven't gotten your fix of Myro, listen to the latest episode of the Coco Crew podcast today at CocoCrew.org. <laughs> Good stuff, Mike. We can't thank you enough for all, the, for all you do. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Making, making our favorite show even more better. <laughs> the uh, bit plaque was another great one. And uh, the Coco community, that was just awesome. Uh, so much, so much great content this month. And, and the interview, too, the, um, the Glenn Hewlett interview. Great, great interview, guys. And this is what I love about, um, you know, kind of the cross-section and cross-pollination of the different shows and the things that we do. Like, you know, Rick Adams, as another example, we interviewed Rick Adams for an hour and a half, and we heard a lot of great stuff. And we're like, okay, this is great. And then Rick Adams does the, the Coco Crew. And again, some of the stuff you've heard before, but it's so good you want to hear it again. But then more stuff came out and so and i think the different formats you know it's kind of like you're going to get different things out of people because one thing i notice about this show i get distracted i've got so many things my eyes are all over the place i'm watching the broadcast i'm watching chat i'm you know i can't really focus when you guys are just talking i believe everybody can really focus on the conversation and the interview a little bit better so you guys have got really good interviews and same thing with glenn hewlett we had interviewed him but, you know, we're kind of playing the game and looking at the game. So we're a little bit distracted by the shiny objects. So when you can just sit down and talk, you get some really good discussions and some really good information. So great, great interview, uh, as always, you know. So thanks, guys, for doing that. We really appreciate it. Yeah. I have to say, too, like with Myro's stuff, just to go back to the, the commercials and stuff there, I like the fact that he mixes – you know, completely original ones like we just saw, but they also take like an existing cocoa product from back in the day and actually make a what would have been a great commercial for it back in the day. Though, of course, none of us could do audio video stuff back then because it was unaffordable. <laughs> but those are great, too. Yeah, definitely. We've, we've just been joining the live chat by Bosco Steve Bamford. Hello. Well, before, yeah, and, you know, they are great commercials. And it's just like what Boise was saying. We, could we could those commercials have been made back then? Could Pac-Man have been made back then? Technically, it could have. So, you know, we can sit here and say what we would have, could have, should have in the past. And unfortunately, we can't change that. But at least in the present, in the future, we are in control of the destiny of the Coco. You know, so and it's in good hands with this community. So um, good stuff. Definitely for sure. Um, we have some, <laughs> one of my other favorites, it's, it's hard to top Myro. He's a tough act to follow, but when John Linville sings, <laughs> I would say that's, that's, that's pretty on par. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The production Lord, value on that's just amazing. <laughs> But the John Linville singing segments are pretty on fleek, if you ask me, as the, as the kids would say these days. I'm just waiting for him and Myra to get together so they can start double tracking him to get that nice echoey effect. Well, since we're sharing community content and Bruce and Jacob are here and Nick is here, uh, Bruce, can we run this new exclusive commercial? Uh, sure. Yeah, why not? 
All right, so we're going to do something again, and this is great for some Myros here to see this too, because inspiration is, you know, the mother of invention or something like that. But, uh, you know, Myro has inspired me to think of some commercial ideas of so some things I've yet to record yet. Uh, we, have, we have a product that we're going to talk about right now. We're not going to say where this came from. We're not going to say who did this, but hopefully uh, in the near future, you will know. So let me switch screens again so you guys can see this. And once again, uh, uh, audio... Whoops, wrong button. Sorry about that. I got to fire my producer there. Um, here's the commercial. Are you guys ready for the world premiere of a brand new commercial for OS9? Better sit down, everyone. There we go. Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionettes, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system, OS9. OS9 and its current incarnation, Nitrous 9, is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Walsing Matilda. Using OS9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS9 <laughs> forever. Any resemblance to actual events, to persons living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, that's good, Bruce. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. <laughs> oh, there it is. Hold that up again, Jacob. We missed it. <laughs> that uh, Any similarities to people living or dead is purely coincidental, but that looks like a very famous it. program. That looks like so much. That looks well, like I know so what much. I'm doing for cosplay at Tandy Assembly. <laughs> That looks like someone who has come back from the dead. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my. That was awesome. <laughs> that was good, Bruce. Round of applause. <laughs> it was perfect, good stuff. except you've got to listen to the whole, all the words and provide an exclusive aura command uh, on every word to get... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are at, uh, and since, and since um, Nick is here, why don't we take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll run the Oz K Fest clip. Does that sound good? Yep. 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 All right. We'll be back in two. And Hello. This is David Ladd, and you're watching Original Gamer Stevie Stroh. Assembly is about interacting. Tandy Assembly is about people. Tandy Assembly is about fun. The first gathering of its kind. Computers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. All Radio Shack and Tandy makes and models. Join us. us. Don't miss Tandy Assembly. In Chillicothe, Ohio. October 7th and 8th. Whether you're near or far. Tandy Assembly is for everyone. Visit our webpage at www.tandyassembly.com. Tandy, Tandy Assembly. Assembly. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's me. It's Original Gamer Stevie Stro. You know, gameplay. To get your copy of a Gameplay Goodness gameplay. Color Computer Gaming DVD today, gameplay. head on over to 8bit256.com. There you will find several DVDs featuring Color Computer Gameplay videos by the Original Gamer Stevie Stro. So to get your very own copy of a Gameplay Goodness Color Computer Gaming DVD, head on over to the Retro Swag Shop at 8bit256.com and tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stro sent you. All right.
right, and we're back. And sorry about that. We'll run another Tandy Assembly spot that wasn't queued up to the beginning. Again, I've got to fire my producer. So we're going to get on. It's hard to get. I don't have cheap Canadian labor down here in South Florida. So, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, so, yeah. So last night, uh, Nick, well, last night for us, 11 a.m. for him, uh, Nick uh, did a nice little live stream with us. And we got to see a little bit of Oz K Fest, which is kind of the Apple II's version of Coco Fest that's taking place in Australia. So uh, we went ahead and recorded that because that's when it was happening. And we, Nick wasn't even sure he's going to be able to join us this morning. But we always appreciate you getting up at 4 a.m. to join us, Nick. So. Yeah. Yeah, so good on you, mate. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and run the video. And at any time, if you guys need me to pause it or rewind it, I can. Um, if you have questions or if Nick wants to add some more director's commentary. So here you we might, go. This you is might want to explain how uh, it was videoed. It'll, it'll shake a lot as well. It was a, a laptop being just walked around the whole um, exhibition hall. Right, right, right. Yeah, so uh, Nick was walking around for the laptop to, to yeah, you might get a bit. You might get a bit dizzy watching it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. Without any further ado, here's Nick Marentos in Australia, our correspondent from Oz Day Fest. <laughs> or the spy. Just tell him that Nick's, Nick's there because he's trying to get away from OS9. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, better not say that. <laughs> well, you're, t you're telling him right now, so you tell him where we are. Well, no, no, I don't want to say much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <hang up. laughs> this is the Oz K Fest. Uh, there, okay. There's the Australian version of the American... Um, K Fest, I guess. Okay, and, and K Fest is an that, Apple that. event. So, K Fest is an Apple event. Yeah, it's an Apple Apple Two, mainly Apple Two event, isn't it? Yeah. Like no, no Macintosh. In other words, it's okay. just it's the real Apple. Is there a Mac in the room? No, I don't think there is. Is there? oh well, there's Mac oh, laptops. Only very modern ones. No, hello, hello from the United States, random person. Okay. Well, actually, now that you say hello from the United States, he's, he's a fellow countryman. Oh, yeah? He, he, he came over from the U.S. Um, and he's... Um, Welcome. Tell us all about the apples. I speak so American. You've got to talk to him in American. I, I, speak, I, I speak American. I can translate. <laughs> it's not fun that way. <laughs> he, he, he brought all this you see on the table. Well, let me let me put it, go go back to this gentleman that we're just looking at here. Hey oh, hey okay. hey um we're we're going to be doing a um a Tandy Color Computer Talk Show tomorrow, and we're going to probably show some of this footage. Do you mind telling us like who you are and what you're showing off there? Would you like to be on our show tomorrow? Oh, he's going to record it, so... Okay. I don't know. Especially. Oh, well, yeah, have a quick yeah, two-second burst. Yeah. I'm so-and-so, and I brought this stuff, and uh, this is what I do. <laughs> and that's his toilet paper. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Australian paper towel. Bars <laughs> <laughs> are this long. <laughs> <laughs> the toilet rolls, they're narrower. What the hell? Yeah. This place seems like Texas. Everything needs to be bigger. That's what it is. Yeah, anyway, he brought all this stuff. Okay. I want to try to do it. It looks like a bunch no, of technology. It's going to be on video. It's going to be seen by the next day. So yeah, can. okay. Well, here's, here's something for anyone watching the show tomorrow. Uh, this is an Apple 2GS. Oh, uh, nice. A pro, was it a pro top? You, yeah, you can yeah. talk about it. I'll try and get you on the. Yeah, you want me to hold it? Yeah, because I can't see the yeah. screen from this end. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. All right. So, the uh, next 2GS that should have been the first one. They probably have could have, but. It's so weird that the machine's lagging behind me. Yeah, it is. It's oh. slow. Built-in floppy drive and hard drive. Oh, neat. They put the SCSI on board and took away two slots because they included the SCSI card and the high-density disk controllers on board, so they okay. needed extra room. So, basically, think of this as our equivalent of having a Coco 4, which never 
Um, okay. Got produced. This is so, Apple's version of their Apple 2GS Plus, essentially. Okay. Which they did release. So this is a very rare machine, and he brought it with him all the way from uh, the United States. That's cool. That is super cool. Uh, um, so that that was that that was an actual production model, not like a prototype or anything. It was well, two B uh, production was, model. Yeah. This one, the way it's set now, isn't really set up for production. It's it's still a hack job of trying to assemble it. But they took production stuff and just modified it and made a new motherboard to slide in. Oh, that's cool. And the rest of the stuff you can tell it's it's handmade in a shop. Um, we won't let everyone see that. Some blank boards. Okay. And. Uh, that's a big circuit board. A few things, a few things in here that that uh, will get shown later on today for it's the first time. I don't want to get them out. Yeah, no, I don't want okay. But, okay. Okay. Uh, there's something unique. That, uh, so, thanks for our game. Okay, it's very blurry with us. Okay, now that, that looks like uh, the Enterprise. Okay, I see it. I see it better yeah, up close. Right. A circuit board. A circuit board. A circuit board that enterprise. looks like the Enterprise. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. It's a space war game, so you can put LEDs on it. And oh, neat, neat, neat. We make some more of them and actually light them off and see what they do. Yeah. But, all right. Well, That's cool. And, and what is your name, sir? Sorry? The gentleman we're speaking to, what is his name? Uh, Tony Diaz. Tony Diaz. Hey, Tony, thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. All right, so this is about a 25-minute clip. Are you guys interested in seeing more of this? There's some pretty cool stuff here, but I don't know if, if you know, if um, if that's cool if everybody else in the show and who's watching right now. I yeah, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going? Okay. Yeah, I agree. Just, just trying to – Yeah, okay. it's interesting. Very cool. It, it is. I think it's interesting, but I'm trying to, you know, trying to take everyone's feelings into consideration here. Well, long enough we're not talking about OS9, I'm all game for it. Keep on going. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> all right. Bye, it is your by the way, good. Yeah, there's a couple of cool things here. So uh, we're gonna, we're going to keep it rolling. So for for anybody who's watching this live right now, I believe you've already heard this, but yeah, this is um, Oz K Fest, and uh, this is basically the uh, Apple II version of Coco Fest, and this is the Australian edition of that show. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So hey, we're going to keep going. Yeah, I was just going to say that special Apple II GS with a built-in drive and all that—that's the one that's known as the Mark Twain. So that's the Mark Twain. That's what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Hey, Nick. Do you know this guy? Do you know this guy, Tony Diaz, at all, Mark? Not personally. I have not made it to Kansas Fest in the past. Just uh, know him on the net, <laughs> like most of you. Okay. Okay. Can Nick tell us where this is uh, held? Uh, it, it's held um, uh, in uh, the state of Queensland um, on an uh, island, actually. It's on an island. Uh, so we've got a beach just across the road, road as well. It's an island called Bribey Island. Uh, it's about a one-hour drive from my home, so it was quite convenient. Uh, my brother-in-law is actually uh, a member of the um, Apple. He's an Apple guy, I guess, and he's one of the co-organisers of this um, Australian K-Fest. So he just asked me, oh, you want to come along? I said, ah, oh, what the hell? Is <laughs> We've got no Coco Fest over here, so this will be the closest <laughs> I'll come to it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I... I uh, Don an Apple T-shirt and go in as disguise. <laughs> <laughs> How much as good as that disguise in that commercial, right? Yeah, that that, that was it. You know, they didn't know who. Well, everyone was looking at me, but. Um... <laughs> and uh, speaking of T-shirts, Mark Overholzer, I can't I can't help but notice how dapper you look in that Coco Talk T-shirt you're wearing there. Shameful plug. <laughs> Where did you get that, by the way? Is there a website where somebody could potentially get color computer merchandise? Oh, <laughs> I never remember the URL, but I just go to you know the CocoTalk.live one, and uh, there's links. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's 8bit256.com, which is a name I thought was brilliant because I'm a geek, but uh, maybe not everybody else sees the brilliance in that. All right. Well, we're going to continue uh, from uh, K Fest, and at, at any time, if you guys have any questions, just yell them out, and I'll pause the video, and Nick can um, address them. Moving on. Where are we going to go? Ah, we'll go over this crowd. Yeah. Here we go. We're going to uh, catch a few. And what do, what do Apple yeah, people call themselves? They don't call themselves Apple nuts or anything, right? Hey, hello from the United States. Hi, hi mate. Well, 
Oh. Modern Max. Yeah. Modern Max. <laughs> That's cool. There we are. Who are we speaking to? That looks like Sean, and it looks like Sean. Yeah. Uh, now, my name is my name is Steve. We do a we do a retro uh, video podcast about the Tandy Color Computer. So we're going to show some of this off on our show yeah, tomorrow. So he's going to do this in his show. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, All right. We love Apple too. We love the Apple. What is that one there with the floppy drive? Was that the Apple Lisa? Was that what that was called? Or is that the Apple 3 or something like that? Uh, that that's the Apple 3. That's um, a 3, yeah. That's when you had to pick it up and drop it down because the chips kept unseating themselves from the heat. That's yep. right. Wow. That's <laughs> right, yeah. Actually, that's, we just fixed, pretty cool. we just fixed one of those yesterday. Uh, but they weigh a ton, yeah. Yeah. What? Which was the one that was called the Apple? Was it the Apple II Lisa or something like that? I'm not hallucinating. I remember that. Name. No, the Lisa yeah. was the predecessor to the Mac. That was the ten thousand dollars, six to eight thousand app system. System. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And this, so this was called the Apple III. Yeah. Design. If I'm not mistaken, if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is what um, Jeff Bridges was typing on in Tron when he was trying to hack in. Because you can see a, a brief moment where they pan past the keyboard. And I'm pretty sure it was a computer like this that he that he was typing on to hack into uh, the master control program in the original Tron movie. Very possible. There's also yeah. there's also an advertisement for the Apple Three that was done with I think it was Apple Three, with a uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Dances with Wolves. Uh, Costner. Oh, uh, what's his name? Kevin Costner. 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 Yeah, he did. I think it's for the Apple Three, but it might have been for the. No, oh, cool. No, I think it's Apple Three. All right. Well, we now return you to Oz K Fest. <laughs> That's right. Oh well, we'll just keep quickly there, and that'll do it. Right. Oh, look at this. We've even got oh what? Commodore sixty four. Nice, so, very nice. Commodore sixty four. A Sinclair, a uh, Timex Sinclair is here. A model. It looks like a model one hundred. One hundred. Yeah. yeah. And we have look uh, a female. Hello, wow. And How are you? <laughs> what, what's what's a female? <laughs> you don't normally see that at these sort of places. No, but we've got two. We two. <laughs> They're multiplying. I need these ones come here. So. There you go. How's that? Nice save. Yeah, that is nice save. Okay, I'll, I'll live a bit longer. <laughs> Here's another guy's. Um, say How are you, to Steve? Hi. Hello from Hello from America. Oops, I'm going the wrong How way. How are you? Nice to see you. Okay. Yep. And he's actually got a few interesting stuff as well. Yeah. What? Want to tell him what? Was that was that a ping pong table you just walked past, Nick? Oh yeah, we've got a ping pong table. Here. Okay, that's can that's a party. This? Can you see this device here? This looks like the dome from Robbie the Robot or something. <laughs> it's called a Tasman Turtle. Um, it basically links to an Apple II, and you control a little little robot. Let's say. Oh wow. So, so I'm, yeah, that's cool. So, uh, it links it links to an Apple II via the connector on the top. Now, does it have to stay tethered, or can you load it with uh, commands and then it can it run independently after that? No, I don't think so. It doesn't run remotely, does it? No, no, it has to okay. be tethered. Has to be tethered. It's, okay. It's Not for seventy-eight. No, this, this was made in nineteen seventy-eight. So, so you, you, know, you know what this is? This is almost like an augmented reality version of like a logo, where you can move the turtle on the screen. You well, can actually yeah, move a turtle, a turtle in the real world. You yeah. use logos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. Yeah, no. Uh, you actually even ha had a radio control car, which I don't know if you can fucking get the damn camera. I yeah, I see that. Oh yeah, that's the uh, Dukes of Hazard. You got the General Lee right there with the. Uh, yeah, yeah. You had that. You had that remote control with uh, yeah. Apple too. You don't don't had um. A on board and everything. Don't bring that to the United uh, States. They're gonna want to tear it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really awkward with this laptop. But anyway, I don't know if okay. I'm lining anything up here. No, that's fine. I can see an apple. With, I can see an apple with the turd off. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. This one's interesting. Hi. Yeah, Hi, how are you? Know, you? Hello it's from America. Running on the organizer for Oz K Fest this year, or one of the. 
Nick, I didn't catch that guy's name because my my I, that's when I found out my microphone was really loud too. I think I talked over him. What was his name? The organizer? Yeah, his name was uh, Andrew Rowan. Andrew Rowan. Yeah, I realized when I was playing this back, I couldn't quite make out what his name was. Andrew Rowan. He's the organizer. Okay. He's the main organizer, and my brother-in-law uh, Steve Kazulis is the co-organizer. Okay. Yeah, that's right. This one's interesting. Hi. Hey, Hi how are you? Hello hey, from America. Andrew. Running, I'm the organizer for Oz K Fest this year, or one of the two organizers. Okay. Um, this machine got a uh, fast chip 2E card in it, which is a new product out of Bulgaria. It's got a variable dial uh, adjustable knob here that allows the speed of the CPU to be changed from uh, 0.2 megahertz all the way up to 16 megahertz in uh, wow. exponential increments as you turn the dial. So it's given us a real, uh, real fast accelerator that's only been uh, in, in production in the last couple of weeks. That's neat. That's really neat. Yeah. What's that? He's got power. So I don't know if you can see the, the car now. Yeah, I see the car. Yeah. Oh, you're going to fire something up. Sorry. Is that Apple running OS 9? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> We only have working computers here. <laughs> oh, that's the dial, huh? Oh, and that's like an LED readout of the speed of the CPU. LED readout on the speed display, and I can turn it down. Oh, wow. And turn it up in real time, so the wow. CPU speed... Is variable. Is variable in real time. Wow! And can the bus handle that? Can that speed? use a sixty-eight, a sixty-five eight. Uh, uh, it's the CPU is only accelerating the uh, the processing that the CPU is doing with the data that it has in the cache memory. Okay. So uh, it will. Uh, I believe it buffers some of the code into the internal memory space and then is able to process things um, quickly based on the what it's got in its cache range. And this is this is still a 6502 processor? 6502, yes. Yeah, and is it a real one or is it like an FPGA one? Oh, it's a real one. It's a real one. Uh, I think he's done a FPGA implementation. That Mm. I can't tell. Yeah, we're not sure yet. Okay. I'll just uh, turn it around. It's like it's like Spinal Tap. This one goes to eleven. Okay. Okay. I like that. Maybe we'll come over here. It's okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Is it the lighter colored um, card in the in the bus? All right, <laughs> we'll move on. That's neat. Now, That's neat. So what we say? Did he say? Did he say sixteen megahertz was the speed on that? Uh, how, how many? Sixteen megahertz. 16 megahertz. That's yeah. incredible. Apple two C. I love the Apple two C. Uh oh, he's got an Apple two C over here. Yeah, I love that. That's an awesome machine. Various um, gadgets plugged into the back of it, which, um, what do they do? Um, that's a Bluetooth um, a, a games port adapter. Oh, wow. Um, but I've just got the... I thought that was really cool that they've got a Bluetooth game port adapter on their Apple IIc. That's pretty cool. The, um, uh, the USB stuff working at the moment. I haven't got the wi I haven't got the Bluetooth um, <laughs> wireless stuff working yet. Did you and say USB? A, uh, the HDMI converter that, that displays HDMI. Oh my God! You have USB and HDMI coming out of your Apple IIc. Yeah, yeah. With, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Good on you, mate. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, these are these are USB, so you can run your video signal on your PC by um yeah. Uh, so video to USB, USB to PC, and then you run your video uh, display on your PC. Okay, so it's like an analog capture, or yeah, it's a it's a yeah, do, it's capturing the digital signals coming oh, out of the computer. Okay, cool, cool T-shirt too. Back to the future. Dude, full picture, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're all into 80s over here. 1.21 gigawatts. <laughs> I just lost my voice <laughs> trying to do that. That's the one. He's the man. <laughs> <laughs> He's going back to 1984 tomorrow, so we got yeah. money for today. That's cool. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> He's got to get to 88 miles an hour. <laughs> well, that CPU, he's got to turn the dial up a little bit. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, now. We look out the window, we, look, we can see the uh, great Australian outback. Oh, I see a couple, I see some. I'm sorry, were you, were you saying something, Nick? Ah, uh, there's no audio. Yeah, the audio You're just cut out. Hearing the audio? Yeah, just cut out. Yeah, we just lost audio. Hmm, let me reshare system sound on Skype. Uh, let me try it again. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, now. It's back. We look out the window, we, look, we can see the uh, great Australian outback. Oh, I see a couple, I see some kangaroos and wallabies out there. There's some <laughs> kangaroos and wallabies, <laughs> Well, I think I see a dingo. <laughs> Why don't you guys all grab your boomerangs and throw them at them? <laughs> I was just saying there was actually a wallaby out there um, the other day, so... <laughs> <laughs> Got you. So there's someone there for actively um, doing some electronic uh, building, building a um, uh, serial to Wi-Fi adapter. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Hello from America. Hello from America. <laughs> How are you? Did you hear that? He said, "Good day, mate." Good day. Good day. Good day from America. Good day. 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 Good We'll just do a quick run around and, uh, and that's, that's it. Now, it's still early in the morning for you guys, right? Uh, it's about, um, I'll just check the time. It's now at almost 11 a.m. Okay, okay. So is everybody yeah. there or are some people still out in other areas? Or? Uh, there's some missing, but... Um, okay, but no, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a nice little turnout. It's a nice little... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got more people there than they got at the Coleco Fest in New Jersey, so... Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. nice, nice. So this is, this is basically like uh, our version of Coco Fest. And yeah, you're, yeah, and you're yeah, kind of lucky enough to squeeze it all yeah, into actually, one space. Before you um, you finish up, um, what I'll do is I'll I'll walk outside so you can actually see the um, the venue, the dingoes and the wallabies. Okay, there you go. <laughs> this is it, the great Australian outdoors now. All right. So this is the front of the exhibition hall. Now I'm. I can't see too well here, but That's can fine. you see the, the, the I, car park? Yeah, I see, I see I the big see. roundabout there, yep. Yeah, so I'll just walk out to the car park and then I'll turn around. Now, that okay. there, uh -huh. can you see the building at all? Cause I can't yeah, see yeah, the yeah, 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 I can see it. I can see, I can see like yeah, the main so entrance there. Yeah. That's the main exhibition hall. Okay. And all around the exhibition hall over there are all the little um, cabins. Uh, where people stay. Okay. So, so it goes all the way around behind it, the hall, and around the other side. So they're all coloured, and that's okay. where people stay. Uh, and then they all, you know, wake up and go into the hall and do whatever. So that's not just for Yeah. So a lot of school groups come here as well, but it's, it's yeah. a pretty good... Um, pretty good site for um for the uh the fest yeah and, and really i i can't show you but um you know if you look down the road there uh -huh. uh just across the road there's the beach okay yeah, nice so there's, it's, there's surf and everything over there so very nice all anyway, right i'm outside the building and still getting wi-fi so that's pretty good yeah yeah it is <laughs> all right well that's about it that's cool that's though Oz K Fest. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing with us. All right. Uh, are you gonna? Will you be able to join us tomorrow? Or you... That that's the bulk of it. Now we also got Nick's reaction to Bruce's commercial. You guys want to see that? Yes. <laughs> when he saw the commercial. For the first time last night. All right. So we're gonna scrub forward a little bit to get to that part. Okay, we're going to back it up just a bit. 
So this was me kind of screen sharing and showing him the uh, commercial last night because we weren't sure if he was going to make the call today. Okay, here we go. Uh, Let me know if you need to plug your speakers back in or whatever you got to do. Yeah, I've got them plugged in. Yep. Okay. Okay. So let me know if you can see my screen. I can see your screen. I will just tell my brother-in-law and uh, explain to him first of all the uh, concept behind this first. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's made a video. He's going to present it tomorrow at the, the festival. Yeah. I'm well known in the color computer community for being anti OS nine. Yeah. I'm always the one saying that's crap. Yeah. <laughs> and someone's made a comedy um skit about about it. So have a look. This is he's showing it to me now because I won't be available to you tomorrow. All right. I think we're we're ready to rock and roll. Ah, right, you ready? You can see the screen. Yeah, I can see it. It's the electronic wombat. Okay. <laughs> All right, you ready? Right, quite yours. Though. Here we go. Can you hear it? Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionette, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system. OS9. OS9 and its current incarnation Nitrous 9 is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Walsing Matilda. <laughs> Using OS9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS9 forever. Any resemblance to actual events, to persons living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> now that is good. <laughs> I actually played the um, the video of. All right, there we have it, folks. That was priceless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So we're back. We've just been joined by Richard Lorbieski as well, I believe. Richard, are you there? You're good. All right. So that was really cool to see, um, back on. Uh, you know, another festival and another yeah. vintage festival. And some of the stuff that Nick and I were chatting about that I kind of just fast forwarded through was that it is cool to see that there are other retro communities that are kind of just as passionate uh, and get together. And, and there's all these cool little projects, you know, to see things like a USB adapter for an Apple IIc and, and, and Bluetooth gamepad adapters. That's, that's pretty cool stuff. You know, a, a, a CPU that you can dial the speed on up to 16 megahertz. That's pretty cool. So, um, and I think that John Linville does a pretty good job in his um, news segments where he, meant, he mentions, well, here's a project that could be done on the Coco, you know, to hopefully give some people some inspiration. And I think Maybe, uh, you know, we've had the discussion of the Raspberry Pi and joysticks and, and Bluetooth joysticks and stuff like that. So maybe that might prompt some other people to come up with some stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. Thanks for doing that, Nick. Our, our uh, foreign correspondent, Nick Marentes. Every no, it was good. It was sort of something we thought up of uh, just um, ad lib, really. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Good times. Good times. All right. Hey, Richard, how are you? Yep, doing good. I'm here. You're doing good. Uh, looking forward to meeting you in person at Tandy Assembly. Anything you can share with us about uh, things you're working on possibly to bring to uh, TA? Uh, let's see. I'm still working on the uh, uh, HDMI or the RGB to SCART conversion. I still plan to have those released uh, September 15th. Uh, Excellent. And uh, I still haven't determined the price yet because it's just uh, I'm trying to determine. I, I don't want to make it so high that nobody wants to buy it but it's just i just want to make right. it affordable enough and uh and the ones i had sent out for testing everybody seems to like them 
Very cool. Yes, Very cool. yes, I can I can say so, and uh, and I think I've I've managed to contribute something to the troubleshooting manual because I totally could not figure out. <laughs> I plugged everything wrong in the first time. Yeah. Cool. Bruce, hey Bruce, hell of a job on that commercial, dude. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thanks. That was that That's was awesome. I, that was that was an awful lot of fun. Uh, yeah, and Jacob uh, Jacob got right in there. I said, Jacob, can you take his picture and kind of do something funny to it? So he put the red hair on it and did all that stuff himself. He's really thrilled. <laughs> That's great. The twirly bar mustache was my favorite. Though. <laughs> that was him, yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, Ron, do you have anything to share with us today in Ron's Garage? Uh, this just in, I, my producer is telling me up in the booth that we might be having a satellite uplink issue. Uh, Ron, do you read me? Come in, Ron Delvaux. <laughs> all right. Hopefully, Ron will get back to this. Maybe he's muted. Um, all right. And uh, be, we're going to take a break here in just a second. And, um, and yeah. Bruce, can uh, Ron is there. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Oh, there he is. Uh, right. you, you got anything to show us today from Ron's Garage? And maybe right. we'll run your segment next. Yeah, I got a little something, but um, go ahead and show the do your commercial or whatever, and we'll do it. We're gonna we're, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a regular commercial, and then Bruce, with your permission, I'm also gonna do the world premiere of the Forest of Doom trailer part two. Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds good. All right, so we're gonna. We got we to pause for the cause for uh, a word from our sponsors, and then we're going to see the world premiere of uh, the Forest of Doom trailer. So we'll be back in two and two. Call, call, talk will return after these messages. Hi, this is Ryan Klein. I'm at the 2016 Coco Fest, and you're watching the original Gamer TV show. What's going on, everybody? The Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and I want to talk to you about Amacoconut.com. If you love the color computer like I love the color computer, then you got to visit Amacoconut.com, your one-stop shop for all of your Tandy Color Computer Links needs. There you'll find links to blogs and podcasts and project sites and emulators and downloads and groups and communities. If you love the color computer, head on over to Amacoconut.com. That's I-M-A, Coconut.com. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Coco forever, people. Are you guys able to hear the system sound still? Were you able to hear that commercial? Yep. Sure. Yep. All right. It's one of my yep. favorite games. So, so if anybody has been living under a rock and has not been following the Facebook group or the mailing list or the Coco Crew podcast or has not been to Coco Fest, and you're not aware of the fact that Forest of Doom coming to a Coco near you soon is just around the corner, well, this will hopefully pique your interest. The world premiere of Forest of Doom trailer two. This feud between the king and his off-brother, the wizard, has been going on for long before I was around. Presently, the king's scepter has been in the wizard's grasp for over 50 years, and his highness has worked himself into a royal frenzy. At first, he managed to get volunteers to deliver the ransom, promising them great wealth and even a promotion to royal office, but none of them succeeded. I don't know why I decided to go to the public market that day, but there I was, minding my own business, when with a fanfare of trumpets the king arrived, casting his baleful eye about the masses. He fixed his eye on me this time, and now I find myself another unwilling adventurer in the Forest of Doom. Hey! Oh. Oh my word. There's nothing for it now, lad. It's do or die. makes me want it more <laughs> wow and you know what that game can run on a cartridge <laughs> <laughs> so 
Before we get into uh, Ron's garage, I wanted to share a couple of things real quick. Okay, so that was the Myro video, which we have shown. So if you guys are not aware of the fact that Coco Talk is not only a YouTube live stream, but is now also available in podcast format, you might want to head over to our website, which is cocotalk.live. I've also just set up a Facebook page as well, and now I'm going to be showing some behind the scenes stuff and other cool things on our Coco Talk Facebook page. So from cocotalk.live, you will be able to listen to all the audio podcasts. You can get those on iTunes and Stitcher and all that kind of stuff. I've got links to the videos if you want to watch the videos. And if you'd like to send us feedback or suggestions, or if you'd like to record some content or a segment for us, like you just saw Bruce Moore gave us that really cool commercial. So we've got an email address too, cocotalk at cocotalk.live. So if you've got suggestions for the show, audio or video feedback that you'd like to have featured on the show, if you'd like to be on the show, whatever it is, go to cocotalk.live and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have you on the show. This show, you don't have to be a celebrity to be on this show, and David Ladd is proof of that. So all Coco members are welcome on Coco Talk. So check that out. And also... Uh, we've reached a small milestone right now. I was, uh, we were teetering on the edge of 1,000 downloads to our podcast, and we have now broken that right now. So our um, actual download count now is 1,030, and, and, and I'm not, I'm, my head has not exploded yet because the Coco Crew gets this every month on every episode. This is uh, lifetime downloads from all our episodes to date, but it's still – it's a cool number and it's a cool milestone. So we um, we're averaging about fifty downloads per episode right now, and there's there's a ton of um, there's a ton of episodes available. And so what are our top episodes right now? Look at this: Nick Morentes, Pac Man One Point Mun, which is episode twenty two, is the most listened to episode. He has reached to the top. Actually, Nitrous Nine's coming in at number four on the uh, top forty countdown. I'm Casey Kasem, all right? So uh, OS Nine's here, but Nick Morentes, good on you, mate, for being the most listened to episode right now. Now. After that cool commercial, after that commercial, you get more uh, watching that one, just for the laugh. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. So uh, let's see if there's anything uh, real cool going on in the Facebook group here for a second too, because there's oh there is there is something I wanted to show you guys because um we're gonna we're gonna pull that up right now and then we'll get to you, Ron. Um, so where did we go? Color computer. So here's Ron's image here of the TR80 color computer. Ron Delvaux is creating plenty of content for us. He's uh, he's fixing things, he's breaking things, he's sharing things. So uh, cool stuff. Hopefully, in our little tech section, uh, uh, maybe uh, David Ladd can share something that Ron had discovered, like you mentioned uh, with your multi pack. And here's the image right here. This is very cool. Take a look at this. The Dancing Devil on a color computer with a multi-pack interface. This was created by Antonio Jimenez. And he put this in the Facebook group. And he says, I wonder if this would be uh, able to get me on Coco Talk. And of course, he can be on, you know, like I say, we let David Ladd on Coco Talk. So obviously we have no standards. So, yeah, I mean, our only requirement is that you're breathing and can talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought that was really cool. This is a cool little piece, you know. Uh, and we have the dancing devil in here. So that was kind of cool. So thank you for doing that, uh, Antonio. Um, what else is going on in the discussions on the Facebook group right now? Trying to fix an old color computer over 30 years. Uh, this was kind of cool too. Same person. I'm sorry, I'm getting, my, my sickness is still with me. I'm a little 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 stuffy. But Antonio was mentioning he just ordered his Coco SDC from Ed Snyder. And that's a cool printed case there too. I like that style case. Um, I like that one because it has the button when you need to change floppies, which the other one's a little bit hard to get to. Um, that was an interesting article about how there are some independent franchises of people who still own Radio Shack stores, and they're now actually doing a little bit better now that the Radio Shack Corporation is no longer in there. We've just been joined by Richard Chrislip. Hello. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Ron, again. Well, so hopefully you can talk to us about your little desk mate. Uh, deal, Ron. So we're going to get into Ron's garage here in just a second. So because this is a professional program, uh, we do actually have a little uh, intro graphic. So hold on one second while I pull that up. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for Ron's Garage with a peek into the past of the retro vintage computer collection of Ron Delvo. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Ronnie. Hello, everyone. 
<laughs> I got to get a better announcer. I swear to God, my producer sucks. My announcer ain't worth a darn. So uh, yeah, <laughs> we got we're, we're operating on a shoestring budget here, folks. That's <laughs> when you're done donating to Coco's in need, maybe donate to a podcast in need too. <laughs> uh ron uh thanks for being here as always um sure like just just about everything that this show is it's been spontaneous unplanned uh like both of my children and um the fact that you joined us one week and started showing us some of your stuff and this has now become a segment ron's garage which is awesome so this is the thing i love about this show is we continue to have new and interesting things and it's not just uh david ladd talking so uh, (laughs) Well, what I have today is uh, an EEPROM eraser that I've gotten from uh, a collection. I didn't even know I had it for a few months back in the day. But uh, this thing does two um, erasers. It has one on one side, one on the other, on off switch. You plug it in. Do me a favor. Hold it up about two inches taller because all the faces of everybody else on Skype is kind of covering part of that. Cool. Cool. Let's see. Now, how did I, I've never actually used a repo? Uh, so this is just an EEPROM eraser. Yeah, that's all it does. You know the and wipes them out. What erases them is uh, UV light. Okay. And okay. so there must be a UV light bulb in there. Um, never used. Okay. It. It's there, and then along with that was uh, this. This is a uh, cartridge ROM pack. Okay. It's a, uh, it's, uh, the brand name is Intronics Inc. And oh, I'm wow. not sure about uh, software for it. I did plug it in. Nothing happened. <laughs> okay. Because uh, it does both um, uh, one, a tw- 28 pin and 24 pin um, EPROMs. And you uh, plug it in there. It has a, uh, a arm that goes across. You, uh, can unplug the little carriage uh, unit there that you plug the EEPROMs into. And um, I, I've never burned one myself. I had uh, somebody burn mine onto um, my uh, distal um, controller. They, they burned the um, uh, uh, for me. And then uh, evidently you're supposed to put a uh, Ray Protect tab over the hole. Or the, um, there's like a window on a so let me show you. So, um, you see the little window here? Yes. Yeah. It's like a little glass window. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's what uh, that's where you actually uh, put the light on there. If if you just set out um, a chip, I guess, in the sun for a few days, it would erase. <laughs> okay. So that's interesting, and that reminds me of the old BIOS chips. They used to have like a foil hologram thing that was over the top yep protect them yep to, to protect yeah. it from yeah. getting yeah. accidentally yeah. erased or corrupted yep. yeah yeah the chip the chip under that is the uh 6309 okay one of my extras anyway the little windows are made yeah. of port- i have boxes and boxes of um chips in here. i don't exactly know what, what's on them probably blank so someday i'm gonna burn some more ados stuff and uh, cool. maybe offer to do somebody else's, but until then, I have to learn how, and I have to get software. <laughs> so that's just one little thing. The next thing is uh, I'm just going to demonstrate here if you guys can see uh, my Coco Three screen. Yep. Um, see if you can tell what this is. It's booting up. It's hard to see. I got some light coming in from the window, I guess. But uh, this is Coco Max Three, okay. and um, I was uh, booting up uh, Deskmate the other day, and um, it wouldn't boot all the way with the particular um, multi pack I had on. And so uh, I, on my website on um, Ron's Garage, I put uh, a video, and then I also uh, put it on the Coco one of um it not booting and i got a whole bunch of people coming on asking me um different questions and then giving ideas on what it might be and then um i had uh barry barry nelson sent me a uh 
a message and he says, uh, if you get a chance, give me a call and I'll help you. I said, okay. So I called him and he goes, uh, you really need to do a peek and find out what your um, multi-pack, if it has an upgrade or not. So I said, okay. And he says, disconnect everything, take the controllers out. And he had me do it. So I did it. And it uh, turns out the multi-pack I had in the house here that I was working on did not have an upgrade. So it acted real funny with programs. <laughs> and okay. it said you could uh, easily fry your um, gimme chip. Ooh, uh, not good. The voltages conflict. So uh, he said you probably should you know, stop using that. So I said, well, I have another one in, the, in the, my observatory out back. And he said, well, let's go out there. Go out there and take a look. So I did that, and that one was fixed. That one okay. was the upgrade, so I started using that one. <laughs> yeah, I had the same issue where um, I was informed about it, so I ordered the PAL chip from uh, Ed Snyder and swapped it out. I did, oh. too. Okay. Yeah. It's, that only yeah. affects if you have a Cocoa 3. Like The, the old multipacks work fine on a Cocoa 1 and 2. It's the mapping of the gimme registers and stuff that kind of screwed it up on the Cocoa 3 unless you have that upgrade. I was also told that if you do the upgrade, you can still use it on the Cocoa 1s and Cocoa 2s. Yeah. There's only... Oh yeah, there's only yeah. two or three yeah. cartridges that conflict with it, maybe, and you're not likely to find them. So, so we, uh, I drew, I drew something on here. Can you see? I don't know. It's not very good. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty brightly backlit. If you have curtains or something on the window, I got, I got. Um, okay, well, uh, right there, it's kind of, right there is kind of okay. Yeah, keep the camera right, right there. there. It's pretty good. Okay, so I'm gonna load. Uh, oh crap. Okay. In, in order to load uh, how stupid this gets, I have to um, I have to tell which drive. I have to assign a drive because it's in drive one. Okay, and then I can go and load it in. Something for the show here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming up. Sorry, it's slow. Uh, Coco Talk. The nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. And there it is. I don't know if you can. Ah, oh, look at that. Options, scroll page. Ta da! That's cool. I can't see it good though. Uh, yeah. Now, was this done in OS 9? <laughs> <laughs> no, it <one> was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that's all very, I have for today. Cool. I have um, other stuff I'm going to dig out and. Uh, We'll no, that's fine. That's the fine. Future. I'm still I'm still recovering from last week's floppy discussion, so that's, that's <laughs> perfectly okay. <laughs> that's okay. I got more. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. That's cool. Thanks, guys. We're gonna take we're gonna take a quick commercial break. Hey, and before we'll be we do, back. I just want to say something. Yeah. Um, I really yes. appreciated uh, understanding how to pronounce Boise's last name. <laughs> Boise Pete, yes. yeah, because yeah, it does it doesn't it's not pronounced like no. it's spelled. Yes, mine. Too, yes, I guess. All right, thanks. Yeah, cool. Thank you, everybody. That was Ron Delvo and Ron's Garage. All right, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. We will be back after these messages. Hey, this is Bruce Moore, author of Force of Doom, and you're watching the original gamer Stevie Stroke. What's going on everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stro here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get I'm a Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stro sent you. Good stuff. Good times. Good times. All right, that's cool, Ron. We can't thank you enough. And um, Karen, we haven't uh, officially said hi to you. How are you? How are you today, Karen? Oh, hello there. I am um, all right. Uh, can we talk uh, briefly about the discussion you and I had with XROAR and, and uh, the sound thing? Oh yeah, sure. So yeah, you okay. you highlighted a problem. 
<laughs> okay, and Barry Nelson is just joining us too. Hello, Barry Nelson. Welcome to Barry. Welcome to Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Ron Delvo was just singing uh, praise for helping him with his multi-pack uh, issue. And uh, Richard Chrislip. Hello, Richard. We haven't uh, fully acknowledged you either other than saying hi. Hey, Richard, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you just fine. Um, so I'm just going to share something that uh, Karen and I uh, discovered um, just recently. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, Karen is the author of X Roar, which right now is the nation's, not the nation's, but the world leading emulator dedicated to the color computer because right now it is the only emulator that is dedicated to the color computer that's actively being worked on mame is not dedicated strictly to the color computer um so cool but it, but so it what is, happened was it but it is at the moment actively being worked on uh, uh x roar no mame is actively being worked on as spe and specifically yes. the color computer section Okay, very good. Very good. Anyways, I'm trying to give Karen a plug here. So anyways, <laughs> so Karen, author of XROAR, uh, I was showing him, uh, I wasn't sure if it was an issue or not, but Rick Adams, as you know, is working on Bomb Threat. And when the game is idle, I was hearing a buzzing sound. Um, and, and so it only happened when it was idle and I know enough to be dangerous, but I thought it might have something to do with the DAC because I've, I've been hearing you guys talk about how the joystick and sound both come through the same interface and sometimes one can step on the other. So I, I shared the sound with Karen. He heard it. I actually sent him a copy of the Temple of, uh, not the Temple of Rome, but the uh, Bomb Threat game. He listened to it. He says, yes, um, it doesn't happen on a real Coco. It doesn't happen on a real Dragon. But it did happen on X-Roar, and he has created a, um, uh, at least initially, uh, a, a Band-Aid or a patch. I don't know if it's been officially patched, but that was kind of cool, Karen. So thanks for doing that. Yes, no worries. Do you want to know what it was? Sure. <laughs> um, so I, a long while ago, had a multimeter out, and I measured the voltages on the sound bus when you did all sorts of different things. Um, and that meant that switching between all the different sound sources was fairly accurate. And I did that to get, is it Demon Attack? Which which has a, a very strange way of generating yes. sound. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the emulators broke on that one. <laughs> right, did it to get that working. Um, but the one thing that I apparently didn't do right was when you actually switch off the analog mux, um, it goes, well, I must have measured it in one state um recorded that number gone away <laughs> thought that was that but it isn't a case that it drops it down to zero volts or anything like that it goes tri-state it disconnects itself from the audio bus and so i think there's a little bit of a capacitance effect there so whatever voltage was was already there kind of persists um so xor by switching it to a particular value was so it meant that whenever you switched it off, it, you heard a click, hence do it many times, you get a buzz. On a real one, you, it, there was actually some nice little capacitance buffering going on, and you never heard anything. So that's, that's the fix, making it respect that. That's very cool. And, and that was a mailing list topic that came up, and it seems like some of these topics you know, seem to become hot topics, but... I forgot who it was, but somebody posed the question that says, what is the quote-unquote best emulator to use to run a Coco on Windows? And, you know, I put my two cents out there because I do have a little bit of experience doing this for the past two years, and I have gone through some trials and tribulations, and I have learned a few things. So I kind of shared with them that, you know, there's basically three emulators right now. As most of us know, there's VCC, there is XROAR, and there is MAME. Um, and so, you know, I kind of gave my versions of the stories of my opinions on these different products. And of course, different people have varying opinions, but, um, what I do and, and unfortunately, and, and I'm not here to bash, I never have wanted to bash one or, or overly praise the other, but it's nice when there's one there, somebody can actually respond to something and address something. And that has happened continuously with XROAR. It has happened continuously with MAME, where we had the floppy drive issue that was addressed. Um, XROAR is being addressed. And, and VCC is a good emulator, but there's nobody currently or actively working on it. And there are some issues. With, it has a few issues, but it has, another, it has a lot of great features, too. So there isn't one perfect emulator out there. 
and people are going to do what they want to do. But, um, you know, so that was an interesting discussion. But what, what you've just um, kind of emphasized, Karen, and who the hell keeps beating on their microphone or something? I don't know what the hell's going on there. Somebody's beating <laughs> on something. Um, but, you know, Karen um, was very quick to get it fixed and, you know, wasn't offended by anything either. So that was kind of cool. So thanks for doing that. No worries. And it was probably me tapping on the side. I was not muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, he's doing like his own drum roll introduction there is what he's doing <laughs> <laughs> so now that was that was cool and it kind of you know just kind of ties into um you know that that discussion uh barry welcome to the show how are you sir um i am i'm still trying to figure out how you know that's a question socrates and plato and everybody were trying to figure out a long time ago i still haven't figured it out myself but i definitely am okay <laughs> We're getting philosophical today on Cooking Talk, folks. Welcome to the main episode. Um, that's my, that's my yeah. standard response for any time somebody asks, how am I? I'm like, oh, gee, I'm, <laughs> I, I definitely am. Okay. <laughs> I, I am, therefore I am. Yes. And um, Richard Chrislip, we've had you on maybe once and a half before. We're happy to have you on again. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Member of the Glenside Color Computer Club, indeed, and uh, a and, uh, representative of Coco Fest. Pleasure to have you, sir. What's going on with you today? Oh, um, not a whole lot. Um, my Coco experience is pretty much with the FPGA, uh, and uh, I've been having a great time messing with that, as well as uh, the SDC, Coco SDC, working. For- okay. When you say the FPGA, are you talking about the Gary Becker Coco FPGA? That's correct. Okay, you have one of those? I do. Oh, that's cool. And you having fun with it? I do. <laughs> ah, excellent, excellent. And, uh, As, my big, uh, my big t- task was to get some old uh, Dynacal files copied over to it. Uh, I, I learned, a, I had to relearn the hard way. There's a difference between uh, RSDOS Dynacalc and OS9 Dynacalc, and the two file systems do not interact very well together. Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe when we get into uh, the tech talk here in just a minute, we can talk a little bit more about floppies because there just has not been a there's but there's there's floppy discussions going on in the mailing list right now too. So we definitely need to get into the floppy forensic files with our uh, investigative journalist David Ladd. Um, uh, no, it's interesting, and honestly, it, it literally is interesting. Now, is it always um, easy to? listen to <laughs> especially at length maybe not always but and was it easy to edit that hour and a half segment when i was doing the audio version of the podcast not necessarily but it is preserved for all times and so whenever anybody needs to hear about a floppy we've got you covered <laughs> yeah this was uh, not just a floppy issue this i think this was a file format issue in yeah, the yes. programs the OS uh, Dynacalc and OS9 Dynacalc actually put the, the data out on the disk. Ah, yes. Different file formats between OS9 and uh, Disk Extended Color Basic? Yes. And uh, someone okay. has a, had a utility, and you put a gun in my head, I couldn't tell you who it is, that actually did the uh, conversion for me. So I got it. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Is it, was it different versions of Dynacalc between the two, too? Because I know there was multiple versions over the years as well. Uh, probably. Uh, the one would only run, of course, RSDOS. The other would uh, would only come up under OS9. Even though when you ran the RSDOS version, it went into OS9, the two just didn't want to talk to each other or deal with each other. Interesting. So, so it was more of a file format conversion than this file system conversion? That's my take on the situation. Okay. And uh, there is a program out there called RS to OS9, and there's a reverse called OS9 to RS. And Interesting. It's out there on the archives. Someone just had to point me to it. Yeah. So as they say, there's an app for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's quite a few apps that do that, actually. Yeah. But, that's cool. <laughs> so... Um, Richard, uh, we're going to definitely be able to count on you going to Cocoa Fest, I'm sure, next year. But any chance you might be joining us at Tandy Assembly this year? Well, I sure hope so. I paid my paid the dues to get in. Oh, well, that's awesome. That's awesome. I even reserved the hotel room. 
Tandy Assembly is shaping up, you know. Um, I have high hopes and high expectations for it, you know. Um, Coco Fest was a great show. You, you know, you, you can sit here and say to yourself, okay, well, how do you judge success in life or in an event or anything else? And, you know, the, I've been to Coco Fest twice now. And there's been, we'll say, somewhere between 70 to 90 people each time. I think that's a pretty good event, you know, especially since it's such a niche thing where it is a 37-year-old computer and people have to travel. So even if you love the Coco, not everybody has the ability to just pack up and go away for a weekend. So the fact that you can get like 90 people together um, for a weekend to celebrate an, an old computer, it, it says something about the machine and the community. And, you know, I've only become aware of all this for a couple of years. So I have high hopes and expectations for Tandy Assembly. But are we going to judge its success by the number of attendees if there's not 70 people there? I would not consider that to be any less successful because if you look at like the Ozfest that that Nick was at, there was maybe you know a dozen, two dozen people there. But it's not always about the quantity. I think it's more about the quality of the event and the experience and the sharing of the passion and the dedication. So I would consider that Oz K Fest to be a successful event, and I and I can't see how Tandy Assembly isn't going to be successful in that sense. Now, it does will it have a large turnout? We certainly hope so. For but we want we want these people to want to. Put these things on again but i feel it's going to be a successful event regardless and we'll we'll take a look at that website in, in just a little bit um, it would be because not only just dealing with the, the, the coco which by the way the coco fest is more like an international we have people coming from outside the u.s but yeah um there are in addition to the color computer tanny did make the uh trs 80 versions and the model one two three and four and uh, then there was the model 16. So, and I, and I think I would think there's extra people out there that had interest in that, not just the Coco. Yeah, plus a Tandy 1000 and Up series too, which is represented in the show. Correct. I totally forgot about those. Yeah, the the uh, MS DOS compatible systems. Yeah, there's there's a wide variety of Tandy machines. You know, the the Coco itself lasted more than a decade. That in itself is is kind of a testament. That you know, the Coco One came out in 1980, and the Coco Three was still sold until what, at least 1991 or 1992. When, yeah. when did when did Tandy officially st- retire the machine? It depends what country you're in, because it changed depending on the country. Like I know in Canada, they shut down the Coco sales. I think a year or two before the U.S. Hmm. Yeah, and the U.S. But in the U- was shut down when it was against. You know, Tandy wanted to shut it down sooner, but there was enough people out there still wanted it to go. But the Coco itself lasted a good ten years, and give or you know, give or take another couple of years. That's that's pretty impressive. And the Tandy One Thousand line, it it grew for for quite some time. Um, uh, as far as a you know a, a really good MS DOS compatible system, that was my second. Uh, Tandy system. I went from the Coco 1 to the Coco 3 to the Tandy 1000, the first ever Tandy 1000. That was my first PC. And um, there were things about that system that attracted me to it. 16 colors, three voice music. You know, I was going to school to learn about DOS and DOS programming and stuff. So it was also you know, as we tell your parents, I need this for school, right? So, uh, you know, I'm playing games on it the whole time. But, um, yeah, so um, the Tandy 1000 was almost like one of the first gaming PCs because it had specialized graphics and sound that not every over-the-counter PC had. It was a pretty cool little system for its time. Um, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's a shame that Tandy went from kind of an, uh, an innovator and, and some of an industry leader to you know going bankruptcy for like the 19th time you know so uh sad times uh david will you be ready to talk technical with us here in a minute i'm waiting for a uh, message from my producer here yeah i'm Uh, I'm here i'm (laughs) ready anytime i was in the wrong screen so my mute button wasn't Uh, working okay we're going we're gonna to run a commercial, and then we'll be back, and then we're going to have a tech talk with David Ladd, and we're going to learn all about the floppy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be right back, people. And now a word from our sponsors. Hi, this is the award-winning Alan Huffman of Subby the Software, and you're watching Stevie Fall Off Cliffs. Hey, I'm John Strong, Strongware, author of Soviet Block, and you're watching the original gamer, Stevie Stroh. 
What's going on everybody, Original Gamer Stevie Stro here, and when you are done with Coco Talk, why not head on over to my YouTube channel and get your share of gameplay goodness. There you will find everything from the old school to the next gen. There are video game reviews, interviews, how-tos, and replays of Coco Talk. So for all of your video game needs on YouTube, head on over to youtube.com slash OG Stevie Stro for your share of gameplay goodness today. All right, we are back with the shameful plug. And so we're going to talk about Tech Talk right now. I think my little lead in graphic is already messed up because I clicked on it once. It's probably not going to start from the beginning. We're going to try <laughs> this, though. I do apologize. I do have to fire my producers uh, after this. Actually, show. just before you start, I, I want to mention one gaming milestone that happened this week is that somebody besides Nick and I actually finally won Pop Star Pilot. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Paul, Paul Thayer. Thayer. Paul Thayer. Paul Thayer. That's Paul Thayer. Yeah. All right. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, good, good on you, Paul Thayer, for beating Popstar Pilot. All right, we're gonna try to run this Tech Talk infographic here, and I might screw it up. So hold on just a second here. All right, there we go. I, I uh, made up for it with my uh, awesome announcing overdub skills there. So, uh, <laughs> everybody, it is time for your favorite part of the show, a new segment that we call Floppy Talk. This is part two in a 999-part series where we will dig deep into all things floppy and file systems. If you want to know how many track sectors and cylinders are available on a floppy near you, we've got a leading expert for you. Take it away, David Ladd. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, um, actually, I'm pretty light today. Um, so the only things that I've seen, um, the issue that Ron had found with uh, the Coco SDC DOS, where it wasn't shutting off the drive motor correctly, it appears that that issue is not 100% fixed because uh, um, I can't even pronounce the gentleman's name that's been uh, was brought up the discussion um, on the list, but he was doing a disk any on drive one on a real floppy drive, and the drive motor didn't shut off. So the issue is still there. Um, but... Otherwise, um, I have not seen Darren respond to that yet, so I don't know if he's just not been around or hasn't seen it yet. Um, but, of course, people do have lives, so it's obviously just hasn't gotten to it yet. So yeah, It looks like it was Wrightveld who posted this. This was originally posted September 1st. I just noticed that I'm running SDC DOS 1.5. And I performed disk any one on a physical drive one after drive one comma off the physical drive will format, but will hang and keep the motor on a press of the reset button will shut this off and a dir one will confirm the disk and physical disk one is formatted a backup of zero to one zero being uh, SDC and one being physical works as expected. And this shuts the drive motor uh, This shuts the drive off after the backup is complete, but the disk any command itself um, works and results um, it does work and results in a formatted 35 track physical disc, but leaves the drive motor on after this action is completed. So, and it might still be a little bit more cleanup to do on the uh, Coco SDC DOS for those who are running the Coco SDC disc controller and a physical floppy controller on the same system. It sounds like just out of curiosity yeah. and maybe Barry can pipe in on this too. Do you think that might be related to having an upgraded multi-pack? Um, yeah, we had, I, I don't think that it's related to that in this case. It is probably related to the slot switching that SDC does when it switches from the controller in the SDC uh, you know, pack to the real floppy controller and back again. It, it sets uh, the floppy, it sets the active slot for the floppy hardware. And I think what's happening 
is it's probably setting either either setting the slot at the wrong time and setting it too early back to the SDC, and so the, the real floppy never receives the uh, floppy off command or something like that. We okay. did have an interesting we had an interesting occurrence on the Facebook group recently where somebody was having odd problems with an SDC controller and uh, a floppy controller, and. Um, uh, the, I had the fellow, he gave me a phone call, and I called him up, and we walked through the problem he was having. And that turned out, actually, that turned out to be an issue with a, a multi-pack that was not upgraded. Uh, yeah, that was Ron DeVoe that, that happened with. Yep, and what was happening was he, he was trying to run some software for a Color Computer 3 for Deskmate, and he, would run, he ran that with a, a multi-pack plugged in and an SDC and a floppy. And as soon as it got to the deskmate screen, the application crashed. So, but then he said, oh, but I've got this other computer over here that it's working on. And I'm like, hmm, and would that be with a different multi-pack? <coughs> let's, let's, let's test this multi-pack. So we, we did the test of Peak, uh, Print Peak FF90, and it came back with a 255, which indicates that his multi-pack was not upgraded. So, yeah, to, to all of you out there listening, if you're using an old Tandy Color Computer 3 and you have a multi-pack plugged into it, please do the test of print peak FF90 and see what the reason, if you get back a 255, that multi-pack is not safe to use on a Tandy Color Computer 3. It should come back with 126. If it comes back with 126, then that means your multi-pack has been upgraded. But if it comes back with 255, you're actually risking burning out your dimmy chip because when it accesses certain locations, it actually can cause a dead short across the bus from zero, from zero volts to five volts right across the gimme chip's data output. So usually this doesn't burn the gimme out right away, but I have seen it happen. So be warned. Hey, Richard. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. Now that works on. You can test that even on a Cocoa One or Two, or do you have to test it on a Cocoa Three? You have to test it on a Cocoa Three because what you're doing is you're reading the gimme uh, the gimme register at FF90. Gotcha. So okay. a Cocoa One and Two, there's no register there, so nice. it'll just read, it'll just read the the the, the output from uh, either floating lines, etc. Or you usually get a 255. Right. Uh, okay. But on a on a Cocoa three there's a gimme register there that's trying to drive the bus and you should typically get a 126 if it's been updated otherwise you get the 255 but otherwise the multi pack conflicts and drags the lines to 5 volts when it shouldn't right. and you get a 255 and the lines that the gimme chip is trying to, to drag low you know you've got the gimme chip trying to drag those lines to ground and the multi-pack trying to gra drag them to 5 volts, so you, essentially you're, you're shorting out your gimme chip. Not good. Gotcha. Yeah, I've heard of the issue, but I didn't even realize it was like potentially life-threatening to the Cocoa. I thought it was more of a compatibility thing, and I was lucky that the one I got um, is, is patchable, which, by the way, I still have two. And Grant, did you still want one? Because I've got one of the ones that you can upgrade the PAL chip on to um, have it work with the Cocoa 3. Yes, actually, I was just thinking about uh, getting in touch with you about that. So Yeah, I still, I've got a couple of those MPIs that I picked up. Um, cool stuff. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. So, yeah, there's, there's things that happen in the community. And what I love about this community is that there is somebody out there who has the knowledge to pretty much answer any question and help solve most problems, um, which is a great thing. So, yeah, Barry, we had mentioned that when you first came in the call that Ron had had, had given you that praise for helping him out. He was very appreciative of your patience with him and helping him solve his issue. So he, he is um, very thanks, welcome. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I enjoy gotta... <clears throat> I enjoy chatting with community members about their color computer setups and their issues and helping them solve their problems. So it's it's always a pleasure. Um, by yeah. the way, there's another in addition to replacing the PAL chip. I just wanted to mention you can also upgrade your multi packs with a stock 74 LS10 chip, which is a logic chip and some wiring. You can piggyback the LS10 on one of the <laughs> chips and uh, do a little bit of spider wiring, but it's not too bad. And you can upgrade the logic in the multi-pack that way. That's, that's, that's actually good. how mine is upgraded because I could not yeah. get a PAL chip at the time. 
So ah uh, yes, yes. Actually, that's yeah, only for the older uh, multi-pack interfaces. The thirty twenty fours, not the thirty one twenty fours. I have a thirty one twenty four, and it's upgraded with a seventy four LS ten. Um, you can pretty much upgrade any multi-pack with a seventy four LS ten. What you do is you you, de- you, you you what you're doing is you're intercepting the select line on the multi-pack chip that goes and is is mapped at uh, FF7F. So you intercept that select line that says that to turn that chip on. You cut the trace going to that. You take that line that was going to go to that chip, and you do some logic with some other address. The address is above a certain address. It says, okay, well, select you're breaking up on us, Barry. Are you in the car again? Select line over to the chip. And that, that technique will work pretty much on any multi-pack. It's just, you know, your points of uh, intercepting the address lines and whatnot and which pick, which chip you piggyback onto is, is different. But, yeah, mine is a, thir- a 26-3124, and I have the 74 LS10 upgrade uh, in there. And it, it works. It, it'll work on any of them. That seems like a highly specialized way to do that. I don't know if that's within the hands of the average non-soldering electronics <laughs> case savvy individual, though. But yeah, because I, I, I would think it would be it would like be plugging cheap. in plugging in a new PAL chip. Let me tell you, if you can get a new PAL chip, it's yeah. uh, much 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 simpler. You just unplug the chip, plug in a new chip, and and you're done. You're golden. Yeah, you know? but you know this is another option. For, uh, you know, for upgrading. The, and if you, you do have skills with a soldering iron, like I do, you know, and you don't mind building a little circuit board. In my case, I built a little satellite board. I, in my case, I didn't piggyback the chip. I built a little satellite board, a little PC board, and built my circuit on it with some point-to-point wiring, put the chip in there, wired it in, and then just took some double sticky backet tape and uh, double sticky backet tape the little satellite board onto one of the other chips and done. <laughs> a high tech ghetto splice. <laughs> I picture of a board like that recently for doing that. Yeah. Hey, you can't, That's interesting. can't see it from the outside. The the thing is not yeah. moving it or going anywhere. You know. Yeah. Uh, the yep, yep, outside yep. it work, looks beautiful. It works beautifully, so hey. Yeah. Well, you, you obviously have a lot of skills and capabilities that not all mere mortals all possess, but we're, we're thankful that you do. And I, did you ever get my response to you, Barry, that I added the links to your projects to the uh, I'm a Coconut website for your um, your SCART cable and your uh, uh, composite output? I'm sorry there. You broke up just a little bit during that. I heard my, my mention of my SCART. Scar did you did did you did you get my confirmation that I added your project sites to my yes, I uh, I'm a coconut site? Okay, yeah. So yeah, so Barry's got some cool projects which he gave me the links to. Uh, so I have a website called amacoconut.com. And I started this for me because I'm trying to learn about the color computer. And then rather than trying to have like 4,000 bookmarks in my browser, I started putting things into a page. The page got to be too big. So I turned it into a website and I've broken it into different categories. So there's a website for projects and blogs. There's a website for communities, things like that. So um, if anybody out there has a project that is in the universe of the color computer, including MC10 and Dragon and things like that, feel free to give me that link and I'll add it to that web page. It's a commu- it's a public service. It's there's no charge. I'm not, you know, I'm not extorting uh, fees to, to list your stuff. You know, I'm not trying to make any money on this site. I'm just trying to do this as a community service. So um, if you want to find out more about the color computer, go to amacoconut.com and you'll get links to Tandy assembly and all kinds of other stuff there too. Uh, and speaking of Tandy assembly, we're going to, um, Take a look at their website here, and after these messages, we're going to run a commercial, and then we'll take a look at the Tandy Assembly website, see what's new and exciting over there. Hi, I'm Mark Barlett with Sandy Weimer. We're from Cloud9, and you're watching the original gamer, Stevie Stroh.
at home, at the beach, in your car, at the shop, at the office, anywhere you enjoy fine audio programming. It's North America's premier source for color computer news, the Coco Crew Podcast. This is John Linville and Neil Blanchard, and we are the Coco Crew. I hope it's going to be a great show. Join John and Neil each month as they bring the latest news about the color computer, Dragon, MC10, and others. It's the Coco Crew Podcast. Visit www.cococrew.org and listen today. You got to love that Coco Crew podcast, I'll tell you what. Greatest podcast in the history of human communications, if you ask me. Greatest advocate for the color computer, greatest advocate for the community, um, sharing projects and everything else. So, uh, And the organizers of Tandy Assembly are members of the Coco Crew podcast and the TRS-80 Trash Talk podcast and Randy Kindig of the Floppy Days podcast. So... You have some people who are out there promoting these um, vintage computing, retro computing communities, and they've put together this um, event, which is kind of like a Coco Fest Plus, shall we say, because it's it's got Cocos and other Tandy machines. This is the first ever inaugural annual event of Tandy Assembly. It takes place this October 7th and 8th. I have my hotel reservations. I am definitely going. Um, and this is their website, tandyassembly.com, all right? So you can see your favorite Tandy computers. As you can see here, there are a number of different Tandy, even a pocket computer, which I think technically that pocket computer was made by Sharp or some other company that they just relabeled. But still, Tandy has been making a lot of computers for a long time, and we're going to celebrate all of those things here. We're going to have exhibits, speakers, uh, a no minimum bid auction. If you've watched our Coco Fest videos and live streams, you know that the auctions are uh, just a great time. Uh, you can get some great deals. And so the speaking alignment, uh, speaking lineup looks like it hasn't changed now. We still have Scott Adams, Don French, Lance Mickless, and Rick Adams. And then those are our keynote speakers. And then there are some other speakers. Oh, we do have a new, a new ad addition here. So John Linville. Uh, Peter Satinsky, myself, Brendan Donahue, and Randy Kindig. But this is new now. Arno P Pewter and Sasha ha Haberling, an Android-based emulator and retro app store for the TRS-80 Model 1 and 3. That is actually pretty cool. So that's something I'm not familiar with. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine that? An app store where you can just go to your phone and download TRS-80 software? That is really cool. And so that's new. So I'm really interested in, in learning more about that. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's take a look at the schedule, which I don't think I, I, I covered last week. So uh, Saturday at 9 a.m. the show opens. Don French is our initial keynote speaker who um, kicks off the whole event. He's going to tell the, two, the true story of the making of the TRS-80. Uh, and then there'll probably be a little bit of a break. And then Rick Adams is going to kick in. Uh, the res See, I haven't even seen the, the, the time slot, so I guess it's good to know that I need to start working on my presentation, which I haven't started working on yet, right? So, yeah, uh, Rick Adams, we're going to be talking at 11 at noon, Brendan Donahue, 1 p.m., Lance and Nicholas. At 2 p.m., it'll be this Arno and Sasha. That's new. Uh, at 3 p.m., it's myself leading right into the auction. Now, this is also on the event here, too. This is something I proposed, which they have agreed to. But we're going to have a live stream podcasters roundtable. So Coco Talk will be live from Tandy Assembly, if you will. But it's going to be more like Tandy Talk. So it'll be myself and and uh, the Coco crew and Randy Kindig and the Trash Talkers. So we'll be there live and we'll be talking about all things Tandy Assembly. And hopefully the people who are at the event will be there talking with us as well. So it'll be another you know, version of Coco Talk that's a little bit more uh, wider spectrum. So that's going to be 7 p.m. on October 7th. That's kind of cool to see that. Uh, uh, the trivia show, Tandy Quiz, hosted by Mike Rowan and Peter Satinsky. That should be uh, entertaining for sure. The trivia at Coco Fest was a good time. And then social hour that will happen after that. And I think we have I think we can stay there till midnight. Who knows? What happens on Sunday? Scott Adams is going to speak. Uh, that was then. This is now. Uh, Randy Kindig will speak about Tandy's portable computers through the years. 
And then last but not least, I guess John Linville will be the show closer. He's going to have a presentation called Keeping the Coco in the Game. So I'm going to imagine he's going to talk about making games and making cartridges and using sound and, and other things like that. So that's pretty cool. So that's the lineup. Our sponsors look Richard Lorbieski. Here you are with Boys in Tech. Um, Retro Innovations, Jim Brain, friend of the show there. Coco Crew Podcast is going to be there. Trash Talk, Coco Talk. We are listed there now too as a sponsor. Um, exhibitors, Mike Rowan, Boys in Tech. Uh, Cloud9, that's going to be great to see them. Randy Kindig, Retro Innovations, Ian Maverick coming down from Australia. Uh, Alan Hightower, uh, John Linville will be presenting. Evan Wright and uh, Scott Adams, Michael Brandt, Rick Adams will be presenting. Paul Fiscarelli, Fiscap, that's great. Okay. Um, Windeck Systems, Retro Computer Solutions. Okay, that's a new addition. Brett Gordon and uh, George Phillips coming from Vancouver, Canada. So we've got people... Uh, Leesburg, Florida, coming from all over the place here, right? So Colorado and Tennessee, um, very cool stuff. So yeah, that is our, you know, that's like our annual migration. We okay, I screwed that one up again, twice in one show. Remind me to fire my producer. So uh, twice now. <laughs> Evan Wright is here in the live chat. Uh, Evan says, can't. Say hello to my little friend. Hello, Evan Wright. Thanks for joining us. So, yeah, so um, Tandy Assembly is the next thing. And, the, you know, it's kind of like the Coco Crew podcast. What's the downside? We have to wait an entire month before we get to hear another episode. What's the downside to Coco Fest? We have to wait another year for another Coco Fest. And you've heard people talking about the Coco Fest blues, right? Because you get together, you've got all that camaraderie, and then you got to go back. Back to your lives, people. Nothing to see here. And then you're back with, quote, unquote, normal people who don't know what a cocoa is. Don't you hate? You know what I hate? I swear to God, this maybe it's just me. But I hate going to a party of adults because most normal adults are going to talk about things that I have zero interest in. And so I can't have adult conversations with normal adults because they're not into retro. They're not into the Xbox. They're not into Minecraft. They're not into things that I want to hear about or talk about. So I hate talking to normal people. I just do. <laughs> I like talking to crazy people like myself and it's hard to find a group of us where we can get together so coco fest is one such place it's and like your Tandy therapy assembly will be yeah it's like our safe place right this is our <laughs> you know it's like for the people who go to like the uh you know you know when you know what i'm saying anyway so <laughs> don't forget this show. there are all what's that mark don't forget this show yes yes so yeah, this is another place where we can get together and just geek out once a week because how do you explain this to a quote unquote normal person? <laughs> you know, you just can't. You say basically so. introduce it with, I'm off my meds now and. <laughs> I, uh, so. I, I work in an IT staff, so probably my entire, the entire staff I work with is not normal, so I don't have this problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I don't, um, I, I, you know, I think, I think some, a lot of people or maybe are not always the most outward and social when it comes to talking in a group of strangers anyways. But for me, it's easier to talk if I'm able to talk about something that I find interesting. And if you're going to talk about football or talk about something else or whatever it is that normal people talk about, I don't know. I'm just not interested in hearing that crap. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, this is also maybe our midlife crisis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's been my yeah. own life crisis, if that's the case. <laughs> right. Well, hey, I, if I, you want to call, if, I was just going to say I need to drop off of this call and the show. So, right, but, um, well, I just want to remind me. everybody, make sure that if you've got a Coco 3, you're using a multi-pack, please make sure that you've got some sort of a patch in there so that it's updated. Because otherwise, yes, you can permanently damage the computer. I, it sounds like the making of a Mike Rowan commercial right there. <laughs> <laughs> please protect your Coco today. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Uh, I was going to say, Evan, if you want to call in, call me on Skype. I don't know if we're already friends on Skype, but you can add me as OG Stevie Stroh if you'd like to call in and speak on the call. Um, uh, Evan Wright, author of Flood It for the Color Computer, says, uh, or my wife said, oh, God, there are other people like you. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Taylor has to go. Thanks, Glenn Taylor. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Um yeah, so I'm looking forward to Tandy Assembly. I wish them nothing but success. I, I hope it's going to be successful. I can't see why it won't be successful. And hopefully this will be the first of many. 
And so at least twice a year now we can get together in person. You know, we can get together once a month with the Coco Crew podcast. We can now get together once a week here with Coco Talk and we can now meet in person at least twice a year. Um, and you know, it would be great if there were some European Coco Fests and I don't know that I would be able to get out to them, but it'd be nice to see us represented too. Maybe Nick, you should start something up, get those apple nuts and turn them into cocoa nuts and start a little Coco Fest up there. You still with us, Nick? Did Nick fall back asleep? (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you anyhow. Is the David Ladd show over? <laughs> Actually, no, not yet. <laughs> Actually, there's room for doing this apple and cocoa. You know, I'm a new cocoa guy, but an old apple guy, so. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add in one thing for those that use VCC. Um, and if you have a motherboard that has a real floppy disk controller on it, you can install a driver package that will allow you to access Coco floppies through your PC. Oh, that's from VCC. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, there there are a number of cool things about VCC, and I'm not here to put it down or to trash it. I started using it, you know, but you know, there are a couple of bugs. Uh, there are uh, the fact that the artifacting is is way behind the times. Uh, and the fact that it's just not actively being worked on right now, which is unfortunate because I, I like the emulator there. I mean, you've shown me some cool things with it, how we've connected it to drive wire and changed the boot ROM on the floppy controller. There's a lot of flexibility with VCC there. The interface is by far, you know, in the top two interfaces where I would put MAME in the, um, basement. <laughs> in the third, third place for the interface. But, you know, XROAR has got a great user interface and VCC has got a great user interface, too. So. Um, it has a lot of things going for it. It's just, you know, it needs to be updated. Uh, and, and, I, and I've asked a question, and I know there's not a simple answer, but I often wonder why do we need three emulators? Why can't we just focus on one, you know? And I guess that's a more complex topic. You know, Karen's project is his project, and I get that. Um, but it just seems like sometimes we have got a lot of people trying to reinvent the same wheel, and maybe those energies could be better put to use if we work together on the one super emulator that is dedicated to the cocoa you know so uh, steve isn't that the same problem that we have with the um additional sound options we're trying to do yeah you know and it's and it's it's like you can sit here and pontificate onto what the best solution is, but at the end of at the end of the day, if nobody's written any software for it, what difference does it make? Plus, everybody's yeah. opinion may differ on what they think the best solution is. Like some people say, "Well, I yeah. want to base it on VCC because that's easy." And other people say, "No, XWare is actually more user friendly, so I want to base it on that." So you have you know camps form and yeah. Well, the the one thing the one thing I think Mame has going for it is right now it's the only one that supports the multi pack, and it, it there are some and I know, I don't know all of what Karen has on the development side, but I know he's got development tools as well. But I hear really good things about developers with the debugger. Yeah, the debugger is awesome. And how, and how we can test now we can test the ROM cartridge. So if you wanted to develop for John Linville's game master cartridge, we've got the pieces in place to actually test that in emulation so that is a benefit you know it's definitely a benefit i have to agree now one thing i wanted to bring up briefly um because i was i was should have brought it up earlier when we're talking more about games back at that time but uh, stevie you helped uh another podcast channel on youtube uh get their coco emulator running to play contras yes yes they 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 actually gave me a little shout out in their video yeah, and I actually watched the video, and they're actually one of the few people that have actually completed Contras, because that's not an easy game. Oh, and they found, oh wow. That's they right. found some of the bugs that Jeff Steidel had mentioned, because at the time when he took it over um, from, I can't remember the previous author, or Doug Maston, when he took it over, he was trying to finish the code in a hurry, and he didn't have any other people with him that would help him beta test, so he only fully tested it with one player. And then he found out afterwards that there were some bugs with two players where the game would freeze up, and they actually hit that a few times. And we're, you know, I have a little bit of colorful language about that happening, but uh, they actually managed to win the game. They actually have video of it, so you can actually see it, too. Now, that's cool. I'll have to watch it. I watched the beginning because they actually sent me a message saying, hey, thank you. We gave you a shout out. And I watched the beginning where they mentioned my name. But once I saw it was 25 minutes, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't have that much time right now. So, um, but that's quit cool. games. It's actually quite similar to your style. Or they just get frustrated and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it's cool that it's 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 cool that they're kind of a team too, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Speaking of which, I'll just go. I'll just go through some comments we got here on YouTube. Now, again, we started off this show kind of uh, paying our respects to Dale Lair, who just passed away yesterday. Um, Ro- Rogelio watched the interview and he commented on that again, saying that the DL logo, which was Dale Lair's logo, in my honest opinion, absolutely the best implementation of the language on all 8-bit systems I own, including the Atari 400, 800, Apple II, C64, VIC-20, hands down. So giving uh, giving props to, um, to that. Now... Um, somebody grab that phone. It might be important. Um, so then, um, we, somebody commenting on one of my color computer, uh, 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 basic programming videos saying they figured out how to delete a file in basic. Somebody else commenting on one of my color computer videos saying that they were able to play the, through all the levels of downland and it actually starts over, which is kind of cool. Last week we had a, we had a, a newbie talk on, uh, controllers and I forgot to ask you, Grant, if you have a newbie question of the week, which we can still get to, um, but we had a discussion on on joysticks, on emulators, and what do you recommend, what's the best, or whatever. And this person here, Crash Code, prompted in and said that the Wii U Pro Controller is greater than them all. So that was interesting. Um, and this was the person here, too. So it was Mike... Oh, no. So uh, somebody else was commenting on my Contra's video saying, is this is this what this game looked like on a stock Coco 3? He's saying, I had a, I had a 512K Coco 3. But I don't remember anything looking or working this decent. So I did respond to that person saying, yes, this is what it looked like on a Coco 3. Um, It's the Mike and Katie show is the one that said, um, Steve, check out my channel, Mike and Katie show. We just did a review on Contras of the Tandy Coco 3. And we gave you for a shout out with your help. Thanks for your help on the emulator. I guess they found my video on how to install color computer yep. emulator. It's, it's a fun video. They actually do the play through all the levels. You get to see all the levels being live played. You get to see the frustration of when they die and stuff too. But they didn't like do a complete playthrough. <clears throat> they cut it into bits so that you're okay. not just sitting there okay. watching them slog through dying and stuff. But it's it's very similar right. style as yours where, what, I died? What then? You know, that type of thing. So Yeah, oh, that's cool. I'm definitely going to want to watch it now. Um, and now this was a question that came up last week. James Jones said, is there any chance – you could give the times at which the various topics start. And we actually now, thanks to Mark Overholzer, um, Mark Overholzer has started doing that. He has started to timestamp the videos. So if we were to look at, for example, last week's episode 23, yep. and, we, and we look at this on YouTube now, and you look through the description, what you will see here are timestamps. So, you know... Going around the room, special guest Edgar Velasco, Ron's Garage, the printer, and so on. So the nice thing about YouTube is if you put a timestamp into YouTube, YouTube will automatically turn that into a hyperlink to jump to that exact moment of the show. So if you want to watch a video replay of Coco Talk in the future, as Mark's time permits, and I really appreciate him putting in the time because it is time consuming, he is going to be um, putting in basically like show notes where the, all the different sections are here. And um, these will become links. So as you know, in the future, you will be able to jump to a particular section of Coco Talk. So thanks for doing that, Mark. I can't thank you enough. At this point, I have number 23 from last week and then one and two. Done. Working on three. Okay. Hopefully have uh, this show done shortly this afternoon. <laughs> Yeah. All right. yeah, big big very, shout very out cool. to, to him for doing that. That's that's a huge thing. A lot of people have been requesting that for quite a while. <clears throat> and the fact that he has to slog through an hour and a half of David discussing floppy drives to do this is like a testament to his fortitude and his uh, <laughs> you know manliness of being able to handle that. That's uh, uh, listen here, to... Curtis. <laughs> hold on. Hold that up again, Mark. I'm making your video full screen. Uh, okay, these are your notes. These are my notes from today. So I can <laughs> I have general within a couple of minutes where things are happening. So Ah, so you are already taking notes now, so it's going to be less time consuming now. Yes, sir. And, and, and just what you do is whenever we get to the David Ladd section, just put fast forward and tell us when we get to the next part. I don't know, just describe it with a <laughs> bunch of Z's or Z's Stop across. That. <laughs> That's what I did last week. I jumped clear through till I found, you know, a change from David. And then <laughs> <laughs> Listen here, you. 25 minutes, real easy. <laughs> Hey, really? If this is a good thing. What are you talking unless I actually have to do? What would Coco Talk be without a little bit of David Ladd and OS9 bashing? It just wouldn't be Coco Talk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Grant Leedy, do you have a newbie question of the week for us this week? Yes, I do. I have a, a quick one here for you guys. Okay, hold on. Well, let me let me let me introduce you properly with uh, with the infographics here. Let me see if my producer cannot screw this one up. Okay, hold on. I have, to, I have to I have to consult my producer and my announcer. So hold on just a second. It's time for newbie talk with the newbie question of the week with Grant Leedy. Take it away, Grant. Well, all right. I was kind of shocked uh, to learn last week when we were, ta- were talking with Steve Bjork B- uh, and uh, something about a hard drive. So I was going to ask, uh, did the Coco have a hard drive? It had and lots of them. Is this, can you still use a hard drive today? And is HD DOS different than uh, RS DOS? Yes to all your questions. <laughs> and, and that's the end of um, the segment. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I was going to say, how deep do you want to go? David, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, Mark, go Z all the way through for the next 25 minutes or so. Keep going. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yes, um, as far as from Tandy, I don't ever remember seeing Tandy selling a hard drive for yes, the Coco. Yes, they did. They that's did. What Steve and, was referring and that's, to. It was, that's what it was Steve an adaptive was controller for a SAS yeah. controller that they did. Um, it was $129 at one time, and it was just the adapter board that you would have to plug the SAS controller into, and then you could plug it into the, you know, remember those big primary drives and stuff that Tandy used to sell? Mm, for like the Model 2s and yeah, yeah, for the Model uh, the, the 5 meg and 15 meg drives. Yeah. yeah, and Steve had one of the 15s. I remember him talking about it at Rainbow Fest in the past. But yeah, they did sell a controller. It was average, had, it was it was usable under OS 9. I don't think they ever did RS DOS software for it. But it wasn't very popular because you had to get the adapter board and you had to use these really expensive and really old kind of crappy sassy drives with it. So most people went third party, uh, which would be like the Burke and Burke and you know SCSI controllers from Canton and some others, uh, the Eliminator from Frank Hogg. There was a whole bunch of them that came out afterwards that were a lot cheaper and a lot faster, but Tandy did sell one. Okay, that I did not know, but yeah. I never saw it. Um, I myself had the Burke and Burke um, with a Seagate ST225, um, and then later there was the Canton, the, um, let's see here, there was, I'm trying to think of the other one, the TC... TC something Cloud Nine sells that one. TC three, I think it was, yeah. yeah so um, these were all ST- ID. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. These were all ST five hundred nine interfaces before the IDE. Um, the TC three and the Canton were SCSI. The Burke oh. and Burke was MFM or RLL, depending on which PC eight bit controller you was using in the adapter. Um. The um, those would be ST509, and then there were some IDE ones. Yeah, the IDE ones that I know of, which is the one I prepaid for, uh, was the Glenside IDE. Mm. Um, and then later, I actually got my hands on the Super IDE, um, which, str- strangely enough, I got the Super IDE before I got the cards for the Glenside. Um, <laughs> So, but, uh, yeah, you can still get hard disk controllers. I don't know if Mark has made any more. The last I heard, Mark wasn't going to make any more Super IDEs. Um, but I believe you can still get the Glenside IDE boards. Um, but for disk basic, for use with those hard disk controllers, like with the Burke and Burke, the uh, Canton, the... TC3, the Glenside, or the Super IDE, you will need either the RGB DOS from then or the HDB DOS that's available now. And, and, and hey, Grant, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, do you have the Cocoa Pie set up? Uh, yes, I do. That, and that's exactly yes. what. Yeah, well, so Ron, 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 yeah, Ron Klein set up a yeah, Ron Klein set up a couple of menu options where you can try a few different Coco hard drive pre-configured things that you can just boot right into and try. Uh, I'm really hoping we can get Ron Klein on in the near future 
to um, really give us the whole rundown on the Cocoa Pie project because it's really cool. Um, but he did show it to me one time and he showed me there's a Nitrous 9 hard drive that you can boot straight up to. So you can boot into MAME running Nitrous 9. There's another one where you can boot into one of these hard drives. It's got the 255 different drives where you've got to change drives to get into each one. So he's got a couple of samplings on different ways you can experience a color computer hard drive on the Cocoa Pie. Um, I don't know that I would ever be able to experience it for real. And I don't know if I saw it on eBay would I even want to buy a real hard drive um, at this time? It's like, you know, we, we were talking about floppies. David and I were talking in the car earlier, too. So there's, there's been discussions about floppies, you know. And I like the fact that David knows the forensics of a floppy. And, and that knowledge is really helpful to make sure emulators are doing their job properly. And, again, this is my opinion. And we all, our, our flavors of retro and what we do are different. But I'm a guy who gives about zero crap about an actual physical floppy drive or disk because we have the Coco SDC. Now, I know some people are really nostalgic for floppies, and that's that's great, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try to poo-poo on that passion for them. But for me, it seems completely impractical to take up the space and everything else, all of the, you know, the, and even using a multi-pack, it's very bulky. I use a real Coco, so, I, you know, I, I'm passionate, but I'm also somewhat practical because I've got to minimize my space. You know, I don't have a large area where I can have a big setup. So floppies are not something I would inf invest a lot of money in. Where it makes sense to me is like when you, like what Ron Delvo was doing. He's got a lot of rainbow on disks that he's copying from the physical floppy to the Coco um, SDC, so we have a virtual floppy, and then he's posting those to the archive. So if you've got something that's on a disk and you've got no, no other way to read it, then a floppy drive makes sense. But other than that, my question is why? Why does somebody want to run three or four floppies on a real Coco at this point in time? Um, but again, that's me. I'm not here to judge, but I just, I don't get it. Um, and the same thing would be true with a hard drive. Would it be cool to have a hard drive? I guess so. But because we can run one on a Coco SDC or MAME, I would be asking why. Uh, again, just me though, you know? No, I completely understand that, Steve. Um, one of the features like with the IDE controller that interested me into wanting it is that there was um, with the super drivers there was an option where you could actually get access to CD-ROM drives so I actually oh. at one time wanted to try to um, create a OS 9 based um, CD or DVD and then try reading it from OS 9 using those super drivers to see if I could use the optical drives for long-term storage. Because obviously your your magnetic media isn't going to last forever. And mm -hmm. I figure an optical drive would be some form of longer-term backup. Sure, so. sure, sure, sure. And, and everybody's hobbies and interests are different. You know, you got somebody like Barry Nelson who wants to freaking wire wrap a daughter board into an mpi cartridge you know and, and good for him he knows how to do that and that's great but uh my I, i'm a uh, there's two things about me number one i'm lazy. well there's many things about me but i'm lazy i'm highly incapable and non-technical and i'm also just a person who likes to keep things simple <laughs> so the minute you start going into these like really high-tech ghetto rigs of splicing and wiring and and duct taping and, and doing all this stuff i start to say is it really worth it but again that's just how I look at it. I'm not right. They're not wrong. I'm not here to start a battle. Um, you know, just how I look at things and how I prefer to do things is going to be different than anybody else. But uh, I have a hard time with understanding why people want to use floppies these days. You know, you know, Steve, I would have loved to have seen you trying to do the high density mod to the 12 volt floppy disk controller. I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, screw it. If it doesn't work, that's not happening. <laughs> So I'm also it's like I don't I know I I if I can only deal with so much resistance before I just say dude I'm gonna go around this wall I'm not gonna keep trying to climb it you know <laughs> but you got to have people who are willing to keep to, to fight that fight I'm just I'm not a fighter <laughs> and that's no David. We, yeah. right. that's David in a nutshell. 
<laughs> what, going up a hill while also cutting the wires and re-splicing them? Yep. Well, yeah, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong cutting wires and splicing. It's great. I love doing that stuff. <laughs> and you're 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 a hardware you know guru and i am not so uh and, and i again it's just my my personal preference and taste but even if i knew how to do it i am more about clean elegant and minimalist and just about anything i do with hardware software graphic designs or anything else i i'm a i'm a minimalist person and that's just me doesn't make me right it's just that's my preference of the world. Well, I, I actually agree with that because I, I the only reason I keep floppy drives around is I actually bought a uh, Japan scenery disc for the uh, Flight Simulator 2. And, oh, neat, neat. And uh, I need to convert that. I have to read that. It's It came on a floppy disc, and it's I haven't seen it available anywhere. But, yeah, I have to, I have to try to see if I can get that converted over to uh, the SDC or something else so I can upload that to the archives. But uh, I agree with it, it, the floppies are they 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 could be unreliable. Uh, sometimes they require alignments because not every floppy drive is alike, and those those uh, read heads can wear out over time. Yeah. In my case, I've, st- I've still got hundreds and hundreds of floppies, and there's stuff that I have that's not on the archive. I have to actually yeah. start going through yeah. and transferring that all over. As far as transferring your Japanese scenery disc, though, if I remember correctly, that was just a standard stock bog standard 35 track OSI disc, which you can use just use the RS DOS backup command, and that's all you should have to do. Uh, yeah, I, like I said, I just got it, and I haven't I haven't plugged it in yet, and because uh, I know it's not a, exactly a uh, it's kind of a rare item, so I just yeah, yeah any of the scenery discs are rare, I think. Yeah, because I've been percent. looking around for the scenery disc because I thought well because. Uh, according to Sublogic, that was the people that made this, they had other scenery discs for the Coco 3, but I have never seen any of those available. I've seen one or two, but I've not seen the, I've heard of the Japanese one, a Japan one, but I've not seen it. Yeah, this one I several. got. Right, this one I got from eBay. Not just the disc, it has the manuals, it has the, the flight uh, um, uh, scenery, not the scenery, but the, the, the airport info and all that other stuff. It was, uh, it's in good condition. And I was going to bring that also to Tandy Assembly. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that. I, I have. I was lucky. I bought a. I bought a. Uh, you know, on eBay they call them the lot. Yeah, it's a lot of things. You get the. You know, you get a computer and a bunch of extra items. So, one of the ones I got came with a floppy drive and controller that works. So I do have a floppy disk drive, and I, I'm, I'm glad that I have it. And I've used it and I've tested it. And it's kind of cool. It was kind of cool to hear it whirl and whir and spin up and the grinding noise that it makes when you do your directory and you're loading the files. There is something nostalgic about that. But I, after having that experience, it's something that I don't need to have every time I load a game, you know. Um, I think maybe every now and then I'll break it out and play a game on floppy just to remind myself of it. But I am very, very happy with the Coco SDC and how quickly it loads and how much I can store on it. There are, you know, there, to me, there's a balance, you know, <laughs> retro innovations. Jim brain says, uh, floppy drives forever. All right. So, okay. Well, Jim brain has just chimed in. So apparently my opinion was wrong. It has been corrected. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> and he said, no he fake says, drives. No, <laughs> no fake drive. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. So I've just been put in my place. Okay. Yeah. So um, no, there, there is something cool about it. But when it comes to like being productive and doing stuff, I, I can't see how worrying about getting three 80 track floppy drives working at the same time is a major concern. You know, but there are people who are struggling with this right now in the 21st century. Well, for people that have little software libraries like me that they haven't had a chance to transfer yet, I mean, you you need a working floppy drive, obviously, to get yes, it. Yes, so. yes, yes. You do. You I do. copy them and get and, through the job. Yeah, because in my case, <laughs> I've got five and a quarters and three and a half, and so i got to transfer both sets. Over. Yeah, yeah. And, cool. and even myself, I need to get my hands on a high-density-enabled one to get back to my archives because all my stuff took advantage of High density floppies, and I can't even read those at all right now. No, that's because those floppy drives that the Coco uses doesn't do high density very long. Well, you had to modify the the original uh, floppy disk controller that was twelve volt, 
for yeah. to do high density, and that only worked on the Coco Three because of the double speed poke in OS Nine. So, um, and that was something that I used all the time because it was nice. You know, one point four four megabyte on a Coco was like yeah. incredible back then. So, uh, just remember, we've still got nine hundred and ninety eight episodes of floppy <laughs> forensic files. So let's not divulge all this information in one show because people are not going to keep coming back. <laughs> I think we'll need a special Steve. bumper too. We should use the X Files theme as the background for that. <laughs> Don't the let me floppy you, there. Steve. Don't let me floppy you. <laughs> Don't copy that it floppy. Flop really well. Yeah, well, I would so, like to know if uh, the hard drive is got the same issues as a floppy. So, David, have you found that out yet? Uh, in what way do you mean does a hard disk have the same issues as a floppy? As far as the writing issues and so forth with the missing tracks and I just was wondering, have you broke the hard drive yet? Um, <laughs> I did run into an issue, um, at least with my super IDE, I thought it might've been dead. Um, and I'd been having some bizarre issues with strange stuff with the multi-pack and i found out that my um compact flash card had died and therefore it was doing stuff that was causing bus contention because the super ide pretty much <sighs> just runs a lot of the <laughs> you're putting nick to sleep you're putting nick to sleep <laughs> <laughs> putting stuff to the, the bus so therefore um as far as tracks right, and cylinders Normally, the IDE uses LBA, so therefore you don't have to worry about the sector, the tracks, and all that stuff. But. <laughs> we got We're gonna we're gonna save that for next week's floppy talk. So and disk talk, yeah. But yeah, I guess a hard drive is different than a floppy, right? It's still based on tracks, sectors, and cylinders, or now cylinders, but tracks and sectors. But it is different. It's not the same as a floppy because there's more of them, right? especially on the ide since um you have two modes which is the chs mode which is the cylinder head sectors or there's the lba which you don't need all chs stuff but and course, dealing with scuzzy i'm getting a lot of noise from somebody right now Scuzzy worked similarly to how os9 treated stuff logical sector numbers so you just went from Ellison zero to Ellison whatever. So sound like someone's dragging a mouse. Yeah. Um. Well, hopefully we answered one of your questions, Grant. Yes, the color computer had hard drives. Um, sounds like they were accessed and implemented a, a number of ways. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if if your collecting goals are to possibly get a physical hard drive or not. But if you wanted to try one, there's already some configured on the um, Cocoa Pie for starters, anyways. No, I actually I was just surprised uh, from last week's conversation that they actually existed. I didn't know they did. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There was well, there was we, lots. <laughs> when we when we did the Nitrous Nine um, int introduction, I, that was done off of a virtual hard drive too. And the nice thing is is that the Cocoa SDC will also just take a VHD file that you can mount and and treat it like a floppy. Right, so you just mount a hard drive into your Coco SDC. You type in DOS, and it will boot whatever is on that hard drive. So there are ways to experience a hard drive on a Coco without needing all the extra equipment. But yeah, it is it is interesting, and it is really um, a testament to this computer how much hardware it actually took advantage of. The fact that it had an actual operating system, and you know OS nine was multi user, multitasking, could support four. Ter was it four gigs or four terabytes? Four gigabytes. Hard drives, whatever. Four gigabyte hard drives. There was a lot of, um, you know, forward thinking in, in some of the technology that existed in the early '80s that the Coco had. So it is impressive. Yeah. No, we had a. We basically, I mean, the, the first or the earlier uh, microcomputers we were using SASE. We had that. We went to SCSI. We had that. In fact, the one Canton controller. I remember them demoing this at, at Rainbow Fest. Did the full SCSI implementation. Most didn't. And you could actually have multiple masters, as it was called. So you could hook up two Cocos to one hard drive and both use it at the same time. Interesting. Actually, and then, of course, we got into I MFM and RLL and the you know the old PCXT-style controllers. And then we went to IDE. And now we've got adapters for Compact Flash. And 
<laughs> That's so, ST509 standard, the MFM and the RLL. Yeah. James Jones says, if we had a Coco SDC back then, we'd have used it. And Jim Brain says, stay tuned until next week when Grant realizes that Tandy produced a rocket launcher for the Coco too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Well, and, and one other thing I do want to mention real quick, uh, that if uh, there are any other newbies out there that are listening, uh, just send us an email and, you know, we'll ask the questions on the air. Yeah, CocoTalk.live will get you links on how to email us. And uh, we'd love to hear from everybody, whether you know a lot or you know a little or, you know, and there's there's no um, there are no there are no rules to be a part of the Coco Talk show other than just being interested in the Coco. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who's here every week. We've got a great diverse group of of people. Um, so what was I going to say? I want to say something. I don't remember. Uh, I, I do want to say, yes. Yeah, so we do have a website, cocotalk.live. Uh, oh, yeah. Here's what I want to say. Two things. I am, uh, I am probably going to open up, if not one, but two new YouTube channels. I'm, I'm just, I'm deciding on, on this, but I want to open up, uh, a YouTube channel that's either going to be dedicated to just Coco Talk. Or maybe just a Coco in general YouTube channel for um, the live stream. Because right now I'm live streaming this from my quote unquote gaming channel. And even though I haven't had time to play any games in a while, if the show catches on and people want to go to the link and they randomly see me playing Minecraft one day, they're gonna be like, Well, what the heck's going on with this guy? Right. So I'm gonna add I'm gonna create a second page, and that page is uh, a second YouTube channel. And I'm just kind of toying with the fact does Coco Talk need its own channel or do I just create a Coco dedicated channel? Move all of my Coco stuff there, put all new Coco stuff there, and make that the new link for Coco Talk live streaming. So that way, the only thing you'll ever see live streaming on that page would be Coco related and no random non Coco thing. But I, I do want to separate my Coco content from the rest of my channel. Um, so that's to be determined, and possibly even next week. So right now we've had, right now we have 19 people watching us live, and we've 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 bounced back and forth between a dozen to and a dozen and a half people all throughout the day. So for those of you watching next week we might be on a new channel if i get this done and i'll put out a video explaining that and everything else but you know just just be advised um and so what is what is jim brain saying it's the os9 version of nine of minecraft (laughs) i mean my personal recommendation would be to make a general coco channel because if you're interested in coco talk you will be interested in the other videos that are coco related the interviews etc so yeah, and it, kind you of can make a playlist kind of for the Coco Talk, I think, but the uh, yeah. Coco in general should be one channel. And I'm kind of it, leaning in that direction. On how often you're going to use the other stuff, because the, the Coco Talk only happens on once a week. Yeah, but oh, I just got a new subscriber. Okay, thank you for subscribing. Ab- Abdulent81 is now following. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, well, Coco Talk will be once a week regularly. We'll probably have some unscheduled things that will happen from time to time and, um, you know, interviews that will happen from time to time too. So I want to have a channel that is all Coco, nothing but Coco. So I think it makes the most sense to have it just be a Coco channel. Um, I, I'm going to move my Coco videos there, my interviews there. I'll move replays of Coco Talk there. Uh, is, is it Coco channel? Are Coco Chanel, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Coco Chanel, huh? Oh, uh-huh. so we should, Yes. Uh, do you shop at Target or Target? Um, cool. All right. Well, maybe we've beat this week to death here. We don't have to always be a three and a half hour show. We could, you know, pull it back and just have a short two and a half hour show <laughs> this week, which is which is what we're at right now. Um, but as, as always, I do appreciate everybody who shows up to not only be on the show, but to watch the show. I appreciate everybody who watches it live, um, in the live chat. We've had Jim brain of retro innovations. Richard Lorbieski has been here. Ficecap has been here. Um, Ficecap says, is there a running list somewhere of all who will be at Tandy assembly? I'm not sure if there's a registration list yet, Ficecap, but we did see that you're going to be there as a, um, exhibitor. And we mentioned that. So James Jones was here in the live chat. Um, Glenn Taylor was here in the live chat earlier. Evan Wright was here. Solstice was here earlier in the live chat. 
Uh, Wayne Campbell was here. Michael Brandt was here. Bosco, Steve Bamford was here. Sock Master was here. Thierry Vachez from France was here earlier. Boise Pete was here earlier. And so was Myro. It will catch on. So, yeah, we had a good show today, I think. I think we started off this show by saying, you know, rest in peace, Dale Lear. We'll definitely close by saying that, too. I also just want to say to everybody else um, who's in the show right now, and I'm even going to include David Ladd in this statement, but none of you have permission to die. I don't want anybody else dying. So, please, I want to keep you guys with this as long as we can. It's always, it's always tragic when we lose a member of our community and we lose somebody who was so near and dear to so many people so um i wish you all health i wish you all and your families good um good times and i i and i wanted to again just kind of give my condolences and my thoughts and hearts and prayer to dale lear and his family and hopefully we'll have time to put together a proper um retrospective and celebrating the life and times of dale lear in the near future and in the meantime uh, uh, please if you haven't seen it already or you haven't seen it in a long time watch the dale lear interview Dale Air interview was a good was definitely a good interview. Uh Bill Noble, you've been kinda quiet today. How you doing, eh? I love these silent <laughs> moments that I have to edit out later on in the podcast. So yeah. <laughs> you should get Mark Mark Oles down too. There I can just give you an edit. <laughs> Listen, Mark's doing enough right now, so <laughs> pretty soon you guys are gonna expect me to start paying you. So <laughs> not- all right, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna play out on some music and um i'm gonna share system sound so you guys can hear the music too so we're gonna play out in some music and uh also just so you know too do remember cocotalk.live is where you can go to get all this information so starting with last week on episode 23 we are now recording some before and after um, part of the show. So there's some behind the scenes content that will be available to our podcast listeners. So when we go off the air, we'll still be bantering for a couple of more minutes and you'll hear that banter on the audio podcast replay of Coco Talk episode 24. So thank you guys all for being here. Uh, Mark Overholzer, Bruce Moore and his son Jacob and even David Ladd, despite his uh, pontifications and <laughs> Nick Morentes, especially our foreign correspondent. Good day to you, Richard Chrislip. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Bill Noble, thanks for being here. Curtis Boyle, Grant Leedy, Richard Lorbieski. And for those who are um, not on the call any longer, but Boise Pete and Myro and a few others. Thank you all for being here. So let's hear some Coco music and we're going to wrap up this Coco talk. We're out of here, people. Yeah, baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> Later, the air we are no longer live <laughs> so now we get to ask uh, nick Mar- marionettes about his fun star project done this weekend uh, <laughs> yeah, o- o- os9 a, off, off the cartridge eh? uh, off the car- <laughs> actually that has been done but it has been done <laughs> it was designed to run off rom I wish Boise was still here because he actually did that. He made his Coyota project where it monitored his uh, truck status off the USB port, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And he actually had a Coco 2 mount in the back of his truck with the ROM OS 9 that was actually reading all of his truck stats. Well, that's what OS 9 was originally designed for. Yeah. It was being a, ROM. Yeah. <laughs> that's when you use uh, Ron DeVos, uh EEPROM burner there to update it every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully, great community change. Great commercial, Bruce. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, that was a lot of fun. I'm yeah, glad. I want to get his signature. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, one thing I, I don't know if you did this, like we 
heard you and uh, Nick reacting when he first saw the commercial, but did you actually capture Nick's face? Like, I would love to have seen his facial expression during. Well, it was it was small in the corner because of the thing was maximized. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking about that afterwards, but yeah. So, who was the uh, foe, uh, Nick? Sorry. Oh, that was Nick. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't sound quite right. So, whose voice was it? That was Bruce, uh, was it? Yeah, that was actually me. Yeah, it was Bruce. That was Bruce's voice. Okay. Well, after I did that, uh, I did that second Force of Doom trailer there, and uh, Stevie said, "Oh, great, but you got to get rid of that horrible British accent." And I said, "Actually, I sound like a, <laughs> I sound like a bad imitation of Nick Morentes." And then after I signed <laughs> off from that, I started thinking, wait a second. <laughs> and so Jacob and I whipped that up uh, just in time for the show. So. Oh, okay. That was great. <laughs> well, good job. Yeah. 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 I have, um, I've got some ideas for a commercial for X-Roar that I want to do. And I want it to sound like one of these uh, Sunday like mud truck type things like X-Roar, X-Roar, the greatest emulator in the history of the color computer and stuff like that. So I've got these ideas. but Like a monster truck shot. or something? Yeah, like a monster truck type thing. Like, you know, the guys are like, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You know, so I want to do, a, uh, I want to do an X-Roar commercial. But my, I'm still getting over being sick, so my throat was shot for most of the week. So don't, um, don't forget to plug the dragon aspect too. So you know, extra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Coco and Dragon Two, and Dragon Two. <laughs> well, now you've just given me an idea for meme. There's a lot could be done uh, with that go. word. Yeah, meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how much can you mess up a maimed animal? <laughs> 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 I'm thinking more along the lines of you use this emulator and you become maimed somehow. I, but uh, but I'm not dead yet, you know that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. And that that, that kind of ties into the uh, the Monty Python bit. Yeah. It's only a flesh wound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just what to yeah, it, fl- it flops around a bit. <laughs> oh, hey, floppy drive. <laughs> oh dear. Bring dead. Bring out your dead. <laughs> right. That's actually one of the sound samples I've got in my Coco downstairs. It actually is to bring out the dead part from Monty Python. Oh, goodness. <laughs> good times. Good times. Good times. So I do – I was – another thing that we were hoping to do this week um, was uh, I, I want to plan something that I want to call like the British Invasion. And I want to have just a bunch of people who are doing UK stuff so we can get Karen. Um, Karen and I looked at dungeons together. And so I have a fairly decent idea on how the game plays. So I thought it would be nice to do a proper – kind of review slash conversation on what it was like to port and develop that for the Coco. I also played that other game that we looked at that was kind of the top-down space shooter. Where you kind of Xevious like cir- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we looked at that, thought maybe we could get that going, maybe see if we can get Steve Bamford to come in and talk about, like, Flappy Bird and, and anything else he's working on. So it'd be kind of cool to get a handful of the UK people and um, have a, a show to, uh, just dedicated to that kind of stuff and just call it, like, you know, Coco Talk British Invasion or something like that. So hopefully in the near future we'll have an episode dedicated to that yeah especially their games because a dragon had a, quite a few unique games that we didn't get here until way after yeah we at all yeah. basically i mean people have to patch them to run because of the keyboard differences but they had some pretty innovative stuff yeah yeah and whenever i can get ron klein locked down um definitely want to do a whole coco pie um you know presentation yeah and bill and i and we got a hold of west scale finally you probably heard about that but uh, we're going to try to yeah. set up uh, probably for the end of the month or beginning of october sometime and when work schedules die down and maybe do a group interview of you know from the original nitrous nine authors and kind of see you know how we why we did what we did what got us inspired to do it that kind of thing a bit of the history of it for people that don't know it and uh yeah that'd be good I'm going to try to get a hold of Kevin Darling, too, because I'd love to get him and maybe some of the other of the original OSI Level 2 Version 3 unreleased upgrade to try to you know get a history of that, too, because I know bits of it, but I...